Hi everyone. Um, so my name is uh, Whiskers or Sam, if you prefer to call me by my uh, formal name. Um, I am the director and founder of Music Leads and the Launchpad program, and it's my pleasure to help uh, put this event together with Sean, uh, who founded the Yorkshire Music Convention five years ago or six, five years ago. Yeah. So thank you very very much uh, for coming. Apologies for looking at my phone. I've got lots of details I need to make sure uh, I share with you before we kick off today. Uh, so we're not expecting uh, any fire alarms or anything like that today, and do take note of where the fire escape signs are. Um, but yeah, we're really excited to bring uh, the, the, this day to you. You know, it feels, I won't kind of overly uh, go, go on about the last couple of years and 18 months, but it's great to have everyone in a room together and to be able to hear some really inspiring talks and discussions uh, about building careers or growing careers um, in the music industry. So we've got for you today, we're going to kick off with an introduction from our experts, our experts that represent different music industry, uh, local and national music industry organizations. Uh, and then we've got three panels for you, panel discussions, uh, one from the perspective of new and emerging artists based in Yorkshire, a panel of new and emerging uh, and established music businesses and freelancers in the region. And then later on, we're going to have a panel discussing the challenges that the industry faces right now with things like the recovery from COVID, like Brexit, but also the advantages that new technologies are, uh, are, dis are showing to the industry so, so to be able to push on. And then finally, we have uh, uh, an in-conversation with Nick Hodgson, uh, the original drummer from Kaiser Chiefs, who's worked with people like Mick Ronson and Duran Duran and... Um, uh, Shirley Bassey. And then uh, after that, we have some networking drinks courtesy of the BPI. Um, you will be entitled to some free drinks, or a free drink at least, uh, with, with a token that we will be giving out at the end of the event. So do make sure as you leave later on today, you, you redeem, uh, well, you collect that token from one of our one of our team. And then if you're, if you're up for staying around till this evening, we have our Yorkshire Music Forum Showcase with three Launchpad supported artists. Uh, faux pas from York, uh, Fuzz Lightyear based in Leeds, and Pleasure Centre from Scarborough. Uh, so, without further ado, I'm going to introduce you to our experts. So, these experts are going to be available for for one-to-one -one meetings during the first part of today. That's going to take place down in the bar. Now, you should all have. Uh, this is where the technology. See if the technology works. You should all have received an email uh, in the last five minutes. Uh, with a link to be able to book those slots. Um, if you haven't, there is going to be a link on screen in a minute. And that will enable you to book with each of the six, uh, your one-to-one -one meeting with each of the six individuals. Um, please feel free to book the slots that you feel is going to be of most benefit to you once you've uh, heard from them. Um, but do be, you know, do be appreciative of other people. Try, you know, if you, if you, uh, try not to sort of swarm the experts as well, so be respectful uh, of others. Don't book more slots than you need so everyone has a fair chance of uh, doing them. So, first of all, um, I would like to introduce our first expert, which is Tony Herrera, who's going to be talking about Launchpad and Come Play With Me. Thank you, Whiskers. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm never really comfortable with that expert moniker. Um, most of you, well, many of you know me. My name's Tony Herrera. I run Come Play With Me, which is a, a not-for-profit record label development organization and magazine promoter. And we do clinics um, every couple of weeks with, in conjunction with Launchpad. I also co-run Clue Records, and I teach at Leeds Conservatoire. So I'm here today to talk about Launchpad. Excuse me while I read my notes. So Launchpad exists to support the music sector widely across all of Yorkshire. Everyone can get access from it um, just by hooking up with the advice portal on the website. It has a list of current opportunities, jobs and events in the region and it is trying to cover the whole of the Yorkshire region. Um, there's book about advice drop-ins I mentioned that we run with Come Play With Me um, and you can speak to one of the team there. Launchpad runs two open call-outs every year from which both artists and emerging music professionals, and by that we mean anybody who's looking to set up any kind of business within music, that could be a label, that could be a promoter, that could be anything you like, uh, manager, whatever. Um, so anyone, artists or emerge, uh, emerging professionals, can receive one-to-one -one bespoke industry advice. Um, there is some limited funding available for some projects, and there are some recording opportunities and some live opportunities 
So we do festivals, uh, um, events such as Live at Leeds, uh, Long Division in Wakefield, um, and some, a couple of other festivals around the country. Um, the second open call out for 2021 is actually open right now. So if you're keen and you're interested, um, it's open until Monday the 25th of October. It's about another week and a half, I guess. So anyone can apply at whatever stage you're at, um, as long as they're not recording, uh, re sorry, as long as you're not receiving significant support from anybody else already. So whether, uh, let's say, if you're an artist, a, a music business, Launchpad supported artists without a release before, and even artists who are at the stage of preparing their second or third album. So there probably is something in there for everybody. Um, all artist submissions will be shared with industry, prof industry professionals, and even those ones that we don't support directly We'll often try to signpost you or push you towards a partner that we think will be able to support you. So if you want to find out any more, come along and have a chat with me or book one of the advice sessions. All the details are online. Um, that's it from me. And I'm going to, I don't know who's coming on next. Thanks, Tony. Round of applause for Tony. Uh, next up, I'm going to introduce Simon Benger from Arts Council England. Thanks, Whiskers. Hi, everyone. Nice to see everybody in person. It's been obviously such a long time, so it's great to be out and about again and seeing musicians. Um, I'm Simon. I work for Arts Council England, um, and I'm a music relationship manager. So in my job, I help musicians and music organisations to access and understand Arts Council funding. Um, Arts Council, just a little bit of detail, is, well, it's called by government the national... Um, agency or development agency for creativity and culture, which sounds a little bit kind of obscure, but what that means is that we distribute funding for the cultural sector, and that obviously includes the music sector. So we look to support musicians and music organizations to do the things that they want to do, um, to, you know, to the benefit of, um, of people in England. So that can include festivals, putting on festivals, it can be putting on gigs, tours, it can be writing new music, it can be commissioning new music, and it can be a whole range of other things. Um, today, uh, you know, what I want to talk to you about, if you want to have an advice session, is either of our two main funds for individual musicians or music organisations. And that is um, developing your creative practice, which is a fund for individuals, and that um, is to support you to take time out of your normal work to maybe develop that sort of area of your, you know, your music, your creativity that you've not really had the time to do otherwise. We can support you with up to £10,000 to do that. Um, the other one is National Lottery Project Grants, and that's our flag, like our flagship program. It's a rolling program. It's open all year. You can apply any time for it. And we support people and organizations with grants of up to of between £1,000 and £100,000. Um, I'm not necessarily saying go ahead and just you know, apply for 100 grand just off the, top of, off, off the top of your head, but equally, you know, we can support you with uh, what it is that you're wanting to do. We're really interested to know what musicians are up to, you know, following what's been such a hard time with the pandemic, and we're really looking to support people to kind of get, get, the, uh, get the industry going again properly. So if you're interested in either of those things, then come and chat to me. Thanks. Thanks, Simon. Um, and next up, I'd like to introduce Matt Wonstall from the Musicians' Union. Thanks. First of all, apologies to everybody that I'm not Jennifer Tate. So Jennifer's one of my team, but uh, unfortunately isn't. Um, well, she can't be with us today, so I'm standing in for her. Um, for anybody that hasn't heard of the Musicians' Union, we've been around for approaching 130 years now. So we represent musicians and musicians only. Um, when we say musicians, that basically means anybody producing musical content. It doesn't just mean playing live. So we, for a lot, long time, we've had this trap line, keep music live, which is a key part of what we do. But equally, we represent kind of producers, composers, songwriters, those writing for film, music and TV as well. So it's across the board. And in terms of those musicians, they could vary from on one end of the spectrum. Perhaps we've got orchestral players. I've just come from a meeting about opera. So I have to put lots of different hats on in terms of the job I do. Um, but we represent theatre musicians, music teachers, but most of our members are freelancers. So they're writing, recording, touring um, across the industry. And that's everything from kind of drum and bass producers through to jazz drummers, indie drummers, 
metal guitarists and pretty much everything else in between. So the MU provides a whole range of services um, to members. So you basically choose to join on an annual basis. Um, we have lots of kind of promotions. I don't have any in, uh, information with me, but if you go to the MU.org online, you can find out more about us. So we have a student membership as well and a special rates for, for kind of people joining. So a big part of what we do is, is things like contract advice, as well as things like insurances that lots of people join for. But contract advice, lots of career advice. So if you want to come and chat to me today, that's a lot of the kind of stuff that me and my team do on a day-to-day -day basis. So particularly in terms of the people that might typically be in this room, it might be to do with how your band's set up, looking at things such as partnership agreements, how do we split songwriting, how do we agree the rights in terms of recording, who owns them, all those kind of issues. Um, down to kind of touring, contractual issues, you know, what, what do we do in terms of management agreements, all those kind of issues. There's a lot to get through in perhaps 15 minutes, but certainly open to any and all those conversations because that's what we deal with on a daily basis because we literally deal with musicians across the entirety of the music industry. So I reckon I can handle whatever you throw at me. Let's see if that's the case. Thank you very much. Thanks, Matt. Um, for our next expert coming to the stage, sorry, is Shad from Help Musicians UK. Hey everyone, my name's Shad. I'm a program assistant at Help Musicians. And so my day to day involves answering creative inquiries about any opportunities um, that are there for musicians and also supporting the creative team with administering grants for creative activities. Uh, Help Musicians is an independent charity providing meaningful support to musicians all across the UK and we've been doing so for about 100 years now. Um, our creative program exists to support uh, musicians without any financial barriers getting in the way. So we have a wide range of support that you're able to apply for. And we also recognize that people do need support in times of crisis, which is why we provide a range of support for personal and mental health issues that you may be facing. So in terms of creative support, some of the things we offer support for are support to develop your skills. So an example could be if you wanted to attend a Logic Pro course or say learn from a mentor by going to a songwriting camp, you'd be able to apply for up to £1,500 to take on this bit of learning and development. You'd also be able to apply for support to record and release music. So you could cover the costs for, say, session musician fees, recording, and perhaps if you had a PR marketing campaign together to make sure that your music can get out to its audience. And lastly, we also offer support for musicians to work with creatives and professionals in another discipline. So in the past, we've had people work with Musicians come together to work with, say, lightning directors or with um, theatre makers or even scientists to get together and create a brand new piece of work. And they're able to apply for up to £5,000 to really bring this project to life. Uh, we recognise that um, throughout professional careers, it can be quite challenging, which is why the breath, we have a breath of support available for our health and welfare side. And so we're able to offer support for a variety of um, personal issues. So, so we can offer support for people who may be um, struggling with debt and we're able to provide support in that aspect, but we're also able to offer support for people with injuries and maybe any lingering health issues, as well as voice and hearing health. And um, even leading up, this is throughout your career, so it's from people who are emerging all the way through to retirement, we're able to offer financial support and guidance um, we also recognize that when challenges do arise, it can have a really negative impact on your mental well-being, which is why we have a dedicated service called Music Minds Matter. And this is uh, a service that's available for everyone in the music industry, not just musicians. And it's um, available all day, every day, and you're able to access mental health and well-being advice as and when you need it. Um, there's a whole list of ways that we could support you, so I'm not going to list them all here. Um, just remember, we're always a phone call, email, or DM, or tweet away. And obviously, we'll be down here um, to speak to you later. So, hoping to see you soon. Thanks, Chad. Um, yeah, thanks a lot. And so, our, our next speaker, our second to last uh, expert, is Wes from the PRS Foundation. Hello. Hi, I'm Wesley I'm from PRS Foundation. Uh, PRS Foundation is the UK's leading charitable funder of new music and talent development. 
It was founded uh, just over 20 years ago now by PRS for Music, but has since grown into its own beast. It's now today an independent charity funded by lots of different people. PRS for Music is still our main donor. We share an office with them, still work very closely. But it's important to know as if you're an early career artist, you do not have to be a member of PRS to be able to apply for most of our funds. It's more the higher tier ones that you do. Um, so we are a talent development fund, and by that we mean it's not so much based around community outcomes or audience development for particular things. It's really tailored to you as a music creator and composer. It's your development, whether that's creatively or professionally. Um, most of our funds are all based on project-based, meaning we need a start and end date, very clear outcomes of what you're going to do. All of it needs to be revolved around the creation or the performance of new music, so the direct costs of recording, mixing, mastering, or van hire, session musicians, all that sort of stuff is, is eligible. We have a lot of different grant schemes. I don't know if anyone's looked at our website before. That's a minefield, and it's very difficult to understand where to go and what to apply for. And it's really, really important that you apply for the right grant at the right time. So it's great that we're doing this this way today to come and have a one-to-one -one chat, because to speak broadly about what we do actually isn't that helpful. It's really tailored to you and what you want to do. So. We have what we call our talent development pipeline, and all of our grants work together with the end goal of hoping, hopefully getting you to a point where you are a self-sufficient uh, musician, able to forge a sustainable long-term career in music. So uh, you can come in at our open fund level, which is the open fund for music creators, the open fund for organizations, if you run an organization, or women make music, if you're a woman, or a, a minority gender, or identify as a woman, or if you're a mixed group, and the women in your band make the music, then you can apply for that as well. Um, again, all of those are based on that, what I mentioned, the direct costs of creating or performing new music. From there, we have different funds like the, what we call our Next Steps funding, which is the Hitmaker Fund, if you're a non-performing producer and songwriter, if a top-line writer, something like that. If you don't perform, you just work in the studio, you can apply for that, and that's sort of a one of its kind. There aren't many funds for that, and you can the only fund we have where you can really get a lot of equipment if that's what you need. Uh, we also have our Momentum Fund, which is probably our most well-known fund, and that's really the top tier of what we do. And when you get to that point, the opportunity you should be applying for should be something that is going to tip you into that point of being a fully sustainable musician. In addition to that, we actually run some targeted momentum funds to help those in the regions who have maybe less infrastructure in other parts of the country. And we do one PPL Momentum Yorkshire here uh, in partnership with Launchpad. So that is specifically for bands and artists based in Yorkshire. So we have to speak to anybody about that. Whiskers is also a great person to speak to about that as well. Um, we also have the Composers Fund if you're in classical world. Uh, in addition to that, we have our international showcase funds. So if you're invited to play South by Southwest, Eurosonic, Reaper Barn, anything like that, we can help pay for visas and accommodation and all that sort of stuff. There's a whole host of other stuff. Uh, the Aurum Awards, which is celebrating women in music technology and electronic music. Uh, Steve Reed Innovation Fund, which is about weird jazz, which is with Giles Peterson. Um, we do Musicians in Residence with British Council, which is in different countries around the world. So there is a lot of stuff. So it is really good. If you're interested in funding to help your career, please come and have a chat with me because it's much easier to speak one to one. Cool. Thank you. Um, also, you can come downstairs and book with me, but I will be here all day and I'm going to the showcase later. So if you see me and you want to talk about it, just tap me on the shoulder. I'll be happy to have a chat. Cool. Thank you. Thanks, Wes. Uh, so our final uh, expert to introduce you today is uh, Dan from PRS for Music. Um, and after Dan's introduced himself, we're just going to have a quick turnaround, a quick break uh, before our first panel discussion. So uh, here's Dan. Thanks everyone. Hi, so yeah, my name is Dan Jones and I work for an organization called PRS Music, who uh, are separate to the PRS Foundation. So the PRS Foundation are a charity arm. Uh, if you don't know who PRS Music are, we're an organization that represents the rights of uh, songwriters, composers, and music publishers. We ensure that our members are paid every time their music is uh, broadcast on the radio, TV, streamed, downloaded, uh, played in public, played live, and copied and reproduced. So simply put, if you write music and the music that you've written is being performed in public, and if you're not a member of PRS or you don't work with a music publisher, then you could be losing out on money that's due to you. 
So last year, we processed over 22 trillion performances of music. So there's so much music that's being consumed these days. Uh, and we paid out over, uh, over, I think it's 599 million pounds to our members. So there's a lot of money in this part of the music industry. So Pierce Music is actually rather confusingly the brand name for two separate royalty organizations. There's PRS, who are the Performing Rights Society. Uh, they deal with performing royalties. So when music is played live, when it's on the radio, when it's played on TV, and when it's streamed. Uh, there's also MCPS, who are a separate organization, but kind of under the brand. Um, they deal with mechanical royalties, which is a real term, which basically means when music is copied or reproduced, so like CDs, vinyls, and things like that. There's also a third organization in the UK that collects royalties on behalf of like rights holders, such as like labels and performers called PPL. I don't work for PPL, but I can certainly talk to you about PPL and how they work as well. Uh, I also run my own music publishing company as well. So if any of you have got any questions on publishing, PRS, MCPS, PPL, uh, come find me afterwards and we'll have a chat. Okay, uh, thanks a lot and enjoy the day. Thanks, Dan. Um, so as I said at the start, the, um, you should all have received a link to register and if not, it's, it's on screen there, which hopefully you're all able to access. If you've got any problems, do uh, talk to, come and find me after the panel. Um, about how to access those Meet the Experts panels. Hopefully that's really interesting. So we're going to take a short, just five-minute break now uh, while we sort of reset the stage for the first panel, and we'll be back with you shortly. Thanks a lot. Hello. Hello. Can everyone hear me? Yeah. Hello. I'm Emily Philby. I'm from the BBC introducing the show on Radio Leeds. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. So the panel that I am hosting is all about Yorkshire artists levelling up in partnership with BBC Introducing Live. Um, so this is kind of the opportunity to hear from artists that are doing really, really well in Yorkshire at the minute. And I'm very excited by the people that we have on the panel today. So we've got James from Yard Act, Cole Elsie and Amber from Board at My Grandma's House, all artists that I've probably played to death on my BBC Introducing show. Um, so I think probably the best place to start is how everything kind of started with um, your prospective projects. So I guess we'll start with you, James, because um, I remember us going for a lunch in about, I want to say October 2019, and you were telling me about Yard Act and, you know, you're just going to see how it goes. Um, so how did it all start for you? Yard Act or music? Well, all of it. <laughs> What, life? Life. Um, what's the question? How, what, how did... How did Yard Act kind of come How did Yard Act start? Well, Ryan, Ryan uh, the bass player, my best friend, um, moved into my spare room when he, was, when he became momentarily homeless. I let him move in. And we started writing demos together. Both of our previous projects kind of came to an end and uh it started because we w we just wanted to make music and there was no real ambition uh career ambition for it at the start um and then it kind of found its footing quite fast and we did a couple of gigs uh, at the start of 2020 and then uh, uh, then the pandemic hit and we put our first song out but first we, we had one song recorded and we were like Oh, let's uh, we'll just wait until this blows over before we put anything out, and then if and then quite quickly that became that that wasn't going to be the case. So we put a single out, and it picked up really fast. So we just rolled with it and got a bit more serious with it. And then a year later, a year and a half later, here I am. I guess the interesting thing with all you three is that you kind of started uploading to us at introducing during the pandemic and things seem to have really kind of like skyrocketed. Cole, how did, um, when did you kind of start making music? What made you start making music? Um, I started, started properly when I was 13. I got a, um, I was always like spitting, like spitting and stuff when I was younger. I used to rap a lot and then um, I got a speaker for my 13th birthday and then went out busking in town. And then it kind of just went from there, to be honest. Started getting the odd, like, wedding and performing here and there. Done a couple of competition shows. 
lost them all, <laughs> but carried on. You get me? And then, um, yeah, just just it, it just literally went from there, and then uploading on um, Instagram covers and stuff. And then I think yeah, social media was really the thing that kind of elevated my um, my music, especially at the point where COVID hit and it was everything slowed down. And obviously, I've never done a show before, like them times there and then it was it wasn't looking like anyone was doing any shows anyway do you know what I mean so then yeah it was it was kind of that so it was just a busking and then um kind of performing wherever I could and just singing to everyone what was it like performing at weddings I feel like that must have been quite wedding. bizarre you, you know what weddings were even I'm gonna tell you a little story yeah so this guy yeah he messaged me on Facebook he was like oh um it's my sister eh, no it's my sister it's my daughter's 17th birthday yeah and um, obviously we're similar ages and I was 17 at the time as well. And she was like, oh, she's seen you in town busking and she liked, she, she liked you. And so can you come around on the birthday and knock on the door and then sing happy birthday to her? And obviously we'll sort you out and that. But I thought she's going to hate her dad for doing that. Imagine me turning up at her door and that. And then, you know, and then started singing happy birthday. You know what I mean? So some of them were a bit like a bit close. And it was just literally her and about six mates on the sofa like that. Just thinking, mate, what is this guy doing in my house? <laughs> so it's one of them, but I mean, it's all it's all it's all good practice, isn't it? You get me? So weddings and that, those are those are good. So I mean, it sounds very interesting, very good uh, anecdotes as well. Uh, Amber, for you, um, you moved to Leeds. Was it just before the pandemic or during? How did it? How did it line up? Yeah. Um, so I. So I'm from Cumbria, and then I moved to go to Leeds Conservatoire for uni. I think it was 2019, 2018, 2019. Um, yeah, and I'd, I'd been, like, uploading to, like, BBC Introducing in Cumbria. And I think Tom sent you my stuff from there. Um, and, yeah, but I just started making music, like, on my phone, on GarageBand, and then... Um, uploaded it to like SoundCloud and I was like bored at my grandma's house so that's how I came up with my name um and yeah and then it's just, just come from there. You said something really interesting before we um started on the panel that you've not actually met anyone that you've worked with. Yeah so everything kind of kicked off like during lockdown um so I've like kind of met all these people but only like virtually so now I'm just like gradually actually meeting them in real life which is really weird. <laughs> Very, very but, bizarre. Yeah. I want to know, so when you first kind of had your first single ready to go, what was what was the first thing that you did? Did you send it to press? Did you send it to management? Or did you just release it? Cole, how did it work with you? With that, the releasing tunes and that? Just like your first single. First single. So um, I had him... Um, start of Corona, like literally the week, the week into Corona, um, I signed my deal with Columbia and... Like prior to that, there was just like loads of recording, recording I had. Obviously, it was it was one of them where I was getting approached by a few different people, and it was kind of like um, seeing if I could actually like write and stuff like that and keep up with it and stuff. So I thought I, f I feel like that was a bit of the test trial, and then when I actually signed, it was like li like in the bang in the middle of um, Corona, so the rollout was proper weird. Like it was like it wasn't how I'd expect it to be or. Like you can't, you can't really, you can't really plan things like that. Do you know what I mean? In a pandemic, so um, it was a sick, it was a sick rollout. In 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 that, um, I got my first first song out, and that. Do you know what I mean? But it was all all literally through lockdown. So yeah, it just it just came about through um, meeting different people, ending up um, being with Columbia, and then it just went from there. And then um, the original song, my first song, was featuring Double Hours, and um, I wrote that song way before with Javon. I think it, it was my first session with Javon and he's like a guy that I work with a lot nowadays. Um, and yeah, that song was just sat there just waiting, collecting dust and that. And then um, I was in a session with um, uh, some other people from OFB, the group that he's in. And then um, his boy was like, oh, listen, listen to this song, listen to this song. He's right, he's, he's, he's good and that. And I thought, it, I think he thought like, oh, like, yeah, all right, we've heard it, do you know what I mean? Like that type of thing, like you weren't really feeling it, but then he listened to it and it kind of just, kind of just went together eventually in it. And then just, yeah, man, it just, it, and then it done all right. And that. How did the relationship with Columbia come about? Um, it was, it was through Instagram originally. Um, basically, um, Columbia's got like a kind of, 
it's like there's a there's a thing called too loud, which is like um nuts, nuts, the artist nuts, his peoples. Um they've got like a too loud label, which is like part of Columbia, but it's not Columbia, but it is you get me, that was a proper shit explanation, but um so a guy from there DM me sorry for swearing, sorry. Um, the guy DM me uh, on Instagram and was like, come down for a meeting. Um, I like your music and stuff like that. Just saw the covers because I was covering a lot of notes and stuff in it. So he must have must have seen it on um, through notes. And then I didn't hear anything for like three, four months. And I thought, oh, that was just it. And then um, um, he invited me down for a meeting, went for a meeting. And then because them buildings are so small and stuff, like kind of like everyone talks to each other, you know what I mean? Yeah. And I think like we just got around. And then, um, yeah, there was just like, you all right on that? Do you want to come over the chat? And I was like, of course I do. You're all right. You're more than all right. Um, James, for you, obviously you were saying that you released your single um, Fixer Upper and then kind of things started to build, building momentum. Um, so did everyone kind of come on board after you'd put the music out? Um, pretty much. We, apart from... Actually, we we before we'd even done anything, we well actually after our third gig, we got our manager um, who we work with now, and he just totally sort of nailed it and made us do the right thing. And then the team was kind of assembled through lockdown, but it was kind of around fixer up that we started getting people getting in touch, and and then. Uh, Matt sort of make the decisions, but again, he he was really good at making us not say yes to anything for ages, and just like not making the decisions too fast. And then and then people stepped in a little later down the line that were the people we ended up working with. So he was just always like, "There's no rush." Like he kind of had the foresight to sort of say, "Slow it down." But we met him because Ryan's old band used to be on his label memphis industries so you know we we're connected in the biz so uh but you the longer you do it the more friends you make and the more acquaint the more people you trust and we, so we went in on an equal footing with him he he supported ryan for five or six years and and burnt loads of money on ryan and never given up on him so we knew that he was coming from a good place and he wasn't you know, so there was a level of trust from the start and, and that relationship's only grown stronger. So, uh, yeah, building a good team is really important. And I think a good manager is probably at the helm of all of that, um, which is something I never thought when I was younger. When I was younger, I always wanted to do everything myself and didn't trust anyone. And you should be wary, but also go with your gut and go with people who've had past relationships with other people. Everyone you meet is a new... Uh, is a connection further down the line, you know, mm. even if whatever you're aiming for, just always just keep an eye on people and the ones that you click with, they stick around, I think. Mm. Would you agree with that, Amber? Because obviously you're working with Scott at Clue Records. Um, yeah, I think when like labels came to me, I think it was just important to like, if you get on with them, they're often in it for the right reasons. Um, and I think it's important to have a team around you because I'm kind of the same, like I wanted to do everything myself. Um, but like, they're, they're just kind of there like as a support um, thing. And yeah, you meet lots of other people down the line from like having the connections with them. Mm. So yeah, I think it's definitely important to have like a strong team that you can trust. Mm. I feel like it's kind of difficult to talk about performing live considering obviously the past 18 months, but it is important in any kind of artist's journey to start performing live. How do you think people should start getting shows? Because I imagine there's probably some people in this room that, you know, maybe want to put on their first show or they want to get booked for their, for, to play a gig. How, how would you kind of advise people to go about getting a gig? James, you've done bloody loads. Yeah. Um, going back to before Yardat though, uh, just to start in, I'd say putting on your own gigs and just making connections with other people and just, you know, playing weddings, doing anything like playing live to get your chops up is really important. And it shouldn't be done when you start and you shouldn't be, you shouldn't be thinking about how it's going to take you to the next step beyond how it's going to 
develop you as a as a performer and as a as a mainly as a performer but yeah how you know you learn a lot about yourself the more you get on stage um so yeah definitely you know go about putting your own gigs on uh there's there's way more sort of support and encouragement and stuff like this around now than there was you know when i started 10 years ago um uh seen like local scenes can seem quite intimidating from the outside when you first get to a new city or whatever but everyone is in the same boat and 90 percent of people actually just want to see music and help each other out and make friends uh and it is a really good way of making friends uh, all my friends i've made free music you know uh, the ones that i'm still friends with not that came out wrong that made <laughs> there were all the people that i'm still friends with I've made free music. I cut. I've lost. Uh, sorry. Would you like me to cut in? Yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, with live shows, um, Cole, how did you go about performing live? Because uh, I mean, obviously, you've mentioned all the weddings and stuff, but you played the one extra stage at Reading and Leeds in August, which is massive. Like, how how was that for you? That was unreal, mental. That was um, my first proper show. That wasn't like a wedding or busking or something like that. And that was that was literally off the back of just the songs that I've released in through lockdown and stuff in it. But prior to then, I just said yes to everything in it because obviously it was like she want my manager, but my mum was like has always been heavily involved in it, and she'd be like, "You're not saying no, no, you're doing it. Go on, sing, sing for your supper." That's what she used to say to me. And then um, she was like, "If you say no to things, it's just like a lost, like a missed opportunity." You get me? Like you never know who's listening and that, and this and that. So. I think, yeah, I just said yes to everything, perform wherever I could. And um, that was like kind of like the end result. It felt like an accomplishment of all them birthday parties and, and stuff like that. Do you know what I mean? But every, every, everything's a good experience. Like, I just enjoy performing to people. Do you know what I mean? So like if, you, if I ever got the chance to do it, I'm going to do it. Do you know what I mean? And then, yeah, that come along. And yeah, it was crazy stuff. Crazy for sure. And but you've kind of only just started performing live as a band again. How has, has that been? Um, well, I'd never done a gig until like last month. Because um, it's kind of, I, I kind of was like a bedroom producer. Um, so I'd never even really considered like gigging really because that wasn't like the forefront of like what I wanted to do. Um, so like my first gigs were like virtual live streams. Like I did one for like Rough Trade. Um, but that was all virtual um, and yeah I just I think I like agree like just say yes to things because like any opportunity is a good opportunity um, but also like kind of like know your worth like if if it seems like you're not um, getting what you should get or something like people will still want you so I think that's important to consider as well mm. um, yeah I guess that kind of leads on to a question about um, how do you go from kind of just playing music for free, maybe like putting on your own shows and or getting paid 50 quid to then just getting to the next level? Like, how do you go about doing that? How do you, well, first off, the, the, the fee for being a sport act has been 50 pounds since like the 1990s and it's, there's been no inflation makes no sense and also it's 50 pounds whether you're going to like halifax or london so i don't understand how that budget has been the same and never been inflated and, and doesn't uh calculate distance uh but to get to the to get beyond getting paid 50 pound for a show uh it's just kind of yeah i think what amber said like no you were if you don't have to do everything there's not going to be one it's amazing that you went straight on to the radio one extra stage your first show that's quite rare that's really cool um know your worth you don't have to do everything one show is not going to be the show that changes your trajectory as much as you think it is everything the wheels are going to be in motion and you'll know that before you start before the show starts to change um yeah, so it depends what you're doing it for. Going back to what I said earlier, if you're doing it because you want to learn how to play live and get better and get more comfortable on stage and become a better performer, that's that's one reason to do it. And then when you kind of get past that stage, um, 
don't over yeah don't don't uh don't be everywhere all the time because people will get if people know they can always see you there'll be less demand for you and if people have all, already i mean unless you're absolutely mint if people can always see you and you're not changing up what you're doing every show they will have seen that show so you can lose that demand quite fast but so yeah don't overplay um get a good booking agent but again you can't rush those things i know i just said get a good booking agent and <laughs> you just get one but they find you when the time is right you can't you've everyone you work with has got to want to work with you you can't otherwise it's not going to be a good relationship mm. patience Lots of people, lots of artists that I speak to, um, especially over the past kind of like year and a half, have talked about, you know, feeling like they need a manager or they need a label or they need a booking agent to kind of get to the next level. Would you would you kind of agree with that? Amber, would you kind of agree with that? Um, no, because I think the work that you put it like you can have a manager and a booking agent, but if you don't put in work or like have a vision, that's not gonna help you. And um, I think people who don't have like, like a team in place already, I think you should, you should just act. Like I've got like a label now and like a booking agent, but I'm still just exactly the same as when I didn't have one. So I don't think it's like the be all or like end all. I think you can still have like a strong work ethic and, you know, get to, at least get to a place where you can then get that, yeah. Do you think maybe that's what labels and managers are looking for, like a strong work ethic? Yeah, definitely. I think when um, like labels first contacted me, I think they were like, because if you have like your, your brand or um, like goals, they can see that and then they'll want to work with you. Whereas if you're just kind of like, sitting back and not really doing much um they're not going to want to work with you because you're not going to make any money <laughs> basically um yeah would you agree with that cole yeah 100 percent. i think these these last six months to a year i've realized that like these big machines and companies and that that look all fancy and that like it's sick you get me it's got a bunch of benefits but there's no one in the world that's going to want it as much as you are want the best for you as much as you you get me and like the, the the guy that's employing you or paying you and that he's he's not gonna he's not gonna want as as well for you as you want for yourself do you know what i mean so i feel like the more like you just got to work harder than everyone else because at the end of the day it's your thing it's your music and um yeah man no one's no one else is gonna want it like you so you've got to kind of put that emotion and not rely on anyone else because then that's when it gets long and then and then you get me you go yeah. rehab and that and it's long what would your main piece of advice be for people in this room that are wanting to i guess get to the next step what would your main bit of advice be james um first off do it do it because you love it and don't lose sight of that uh don't put a time limit on it uh, i got about five years ago, I got to the point where I realized I was never going to stop doing it, whether or not I, I uh, leveled up. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and then when I, and I never stopped working on my craft and I never stopped trying, but I also didn't sort of get, I stopped getting frustrated that stuff wasn't happening and just did it because I loved it. Uh, it's Honestly, it's perseverance. Um, I think I'm, I'm probably a little bit older than you two. So speaking from my perspective, I'm 30 and I've, yeah, chipped away at it and it's taken until now to, for things to kind of kick off. But I got to that point where I knew that I wouldn't stop doing it, whether it kicked off or not. And that was kind of, when you realise that, you realise why you're doing it. Um, work with people you trust and go where you, I know it sounds like simple, but like go where you go because, you get a bad vibe off people instantly. And as soon as you, 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 you gut does tell is it is right. 90% of the time, if you get a warning, like a red flag off someone, they're probably not the right person to work with. Mm. Yeah. So pick the right people and take your time and, and just, just keep doing it. Cause you love it. And yeah, and you, have, you do have to work really hard at it. It's, 
not many people get to do it for a job uh, and no one owes you a living. So you do have to like go hustle. <laughs> Carl, what would your main bit of advice be? Um, same same type of thing. Don't, don't rush anything and don't feel like you need, um, say, a manager or a label or something like right away. Do you know what I mean? That's why I try to tell all my friends that um, do music and stuff like that because... I like I don't wanna sound I'm I don't wanna come across as a dick like saying this, but like you know when you do you when you're doing good things and that and then people say like, oh if I had a manager, if this and that, like like I'd be I'd be doing sick, I'd be smashing it. But really and truly, like a year ago, if I had the same manager now, all that would be doing is taking 20% of my zero pounds that I'm earning at the time. You get me? So it's like just just because you've got a manager don't mean he's gonna get you there there. Right? Obviously, there's a point where it comes to it where if if you are at that level yourself, then then so far from so far, you know you can you can do what you're doing. Do you know what I mean? And they can put you in better positions. But I feel like just get in 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 my experience, just get get your team when when you really need it. Do you know what I mean? Like I was in in a lot of meetings and stuff, and it was just me and my mom, and she was getting loads of emails, and then she was doing her reading and that, and she was working and doing both. So then I got a manager eventually because it was like like just need it to happen, do you know what I mean? But yeah, I'd say don't rush it and don't don't rely on other 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 people or don't think, yeah, when I get when I get a manager or something, that's when it's time. Like it's time now, innit? Do you know what I mean? Like just get it cracking from now and and then it'll all it'll all fall into place eventually, innit? Absolutely. Amber, what would your main bit of advice be? Um yeah, kind of the same. Like don't have the end goal of like having a manager or having something. Um, I think if you like making music, just continue making music and continue getting better um, at making music. And then the extra things will like come along along the way. Um, so yeah, I think just don't have like the kind of like material things as your end goal and just kind of work because you like doing it. Mm. Yeah. Should we get some audience questions? Please, if anyone has any questions, raise your hand. Um, is there any questions on the live stream? Not yet. Uh, what's the worst thing about being in the music industry? This is a fun one to ask. <laughs> what? Oh, we've got a question at the back. Yeah, uh, microphone's coming your way. Look how long that lead is. <laughs> yeah. I need a Yo, this one's for Cole. Uh, you said you work with OFB and Double L's. Just wondering, how do you, apart from the stuff that you make yourself, how do you like to source beats and how do people in the industry who are a higher level, how do they like to source their beats? Um, I think a lot with these um, high level rappers, I think a lot of them have come up, come up with producers like the um, J Huss and J5, for example. Um, and a lot of them like, the industry is massive, but it's kind of like little at the same time. Do you know what I mean? So there is like a kind of cycle of producers that go around all the all the drill man and like kind of produce everyone. Do you know what I mean? So I think I think they just kind of it's like it's like artists like you want to work with someone who's who's popping, who's gonna elevate your thing as well as as well as theirs. Do you know what I mean? So I feel like it's the same thing with producers. Um, them man will just work with whoever's like killing the sound that they wanna that they wanna ride. Do you know what I mean? At the time. But yeah, I think um, um, yeah, like a few of the rappers that I've met, they've kind of been with producers from the start and then up to now. You get me? So it's just a mixture of like meeting people through the music that they've made, or just people from the start. Do you know what I mean? Nice one, bro. Who are you working with next, actually? Producer wise, um, who like songs that I've got recorded are just like gonna. Um, so I've got. Um, there's a producer called Jojo. He's sick. He does um, he does um quite a bit of the Dino stuff and um the RD stuff. And I've got uh, you know that soft spot song that um that TikTok song. Yeah, you might have heard it. it blew up on TikTok and that. I've um, uh, I'm doing that, but like a drill version of it in it because that's never been done before. I made some integer, and um, yeah, I'm gonna do that. That's my next thing. And then I've just got a whole heap of other stuff. Any more questions? Yeah, I have the mic already. And oh. um, this is a question for everyone. Um, I don't know, like, what happened. Like, if you all got signed, like, straight away, straight off the bat. 
but if what would you say like when you know the right deal is the right deal and like to know your worth like if you're worth more than something like whether to turn something down or like keep keep it on the sideline and see if you get something better like did you get like signed big deals straight away or did you like wait it out and see what else you could get James do you want to um yeah we waited we had a, we had to make a few different decisions and we turned we turned it did we turn the deal down three times before we signed? Uh, we kept making more demands and paid off because the original deal, if we'd signed it off straight off, it wouldn't have been a great deal. And so you kind of got to remember that everyone is record labels of businesses and they are going to try and save money at every turn even if they love your music so the first thing they offer you isn't the isn't the best thing they're going to offer you if they really want you um and if it is a crap deal it's not worth signing um you can get pretty far without a label these days you don't i mean you can go you don't need a label if you if you do it right but there's a lot of benefits to being one on as well yeah you don't don't rush it. And I'd say if, if, if it's kind of, if, if there's like a trajectory and you kind of, you know, when you're on that trajectory and you know that people are into what you're doing and it's going to build and you, and you start getting the emails in from different labels saying they want to talk to you. Some of them fall off when it gets to the next stage, everyone wants to say hello. And then, and then sort of half of them will fall off. And then you start to get the people that come back for more meetings and then the people from higher up at the labels come come onto the Zoom, and you go, all right, these ones are serious. And then it gets to like offer time, and then it goes round again because you say no to the first thing because it's not going to be the best thing. That you know, it's hard because you really want it, but just not being desperate because it won't change. It won't change everything. Like, you've got to value yourself, uh, which is hard to do when you want it more than anything, but. Yeah, take your time. Always take your time. Was it similar for you guys as well with getting a la uh, getting a label? Um, yeah, I think once if somebody's interested, probably multiple people will be interested. Um, and also, I think even though it feels like they have control and they have more power, like it's like, like they're kind of working for you. Um, so yeah, if if they like give you a contract. And it says like ten years or something. You you could change the contract to make it shorter so you're not tied down. Um, yes, I just think like they try and make. I think they would assume that the artists don't know anything about like the um, technical side of it. So if you do research into like contracts, then you you kind of have the benefit because you know what they're trying to get at. Mm. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'd say I'd say the same thing. Just um, take your time with it, wait it out, and um, try to get as much legal advice or get a lawyer as you as as you can, or as much legal advice as you can. Because like, is them contracts and that? Well, for me though, it was intimidating. In it, obviously, dropped out of college and that got this thirty-page document with bare just gibberish, and I'm just like, what the hell is going on? So obviously. Sometimes it's hard to kind of understand the, the deal that's being put forward and um, just taking, a t taking time to understand everything and ask as many questions as you can and um, kind of develop, a, develop your own idea for what, what it is that they're offering you. And, and yeah, and more time as well. Um, if one person wants you, then an another person will probably like um, click on, you get me, and then... Um, have the same conversations and then and as well when when you're signing in the process like in in my case everyone were proper nice on that so it was nice just to be the favorite for a bit in it and then i held on that for a little bit and then i signed and everyone hates me again so that's on it. <laughs> uh any more questions yeah one at the back Uh, yeah, this is for all of you. Uh, which would you pref which would you start off doing? Would you produce first, or would you start gigging first uh, to get your name out there? Uh, I guess all of you kind of started making music during 
the pandemic when you can't really play any live shows. Um, well, you played some shows before, didn't you? Like with Yard Act. Yeah. Um, again, like I mean, if if you've got to have you've got to work on your craft. So yeah, make sure your songs are good before you start playing. I know that's like about. I know that's subjective. You can't just say make sure your songs are good. It's like as if it's that easy. Um, but make sure you've crafted something decent and uh, always. We always work. Yardat always thinks about a year into the future, and we always keep songs in the pocket. It sounds like Cole does the same thing. He's got always have ammo in the cannon. Uh, make sure that you're writing ahead and seeing where it's going to go next. Because now, especially now for us, now that the world's opened up again and we're touring a lot, all of a sudden you find that the time to write is is, is shrinking and uh, there's a million and one other things that you've got to do. All the all the stuff that you don't imagine you have to do when you when you're in a, when you're in a band or you're or you're an artist. Uh, the stuff that's not as fun, like uh, loads of interviews. Where, where they all ask how where how did the band start? <laughs> 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 Sorry. <laughs> uh, yeah. So always write, keep it regular, and when you get something good, like store it, and uh, yeah, make sure your content is good. Your, your musical content and your online content that's important these days. Apparently, are you all in agreement with that? Yeah, hundred uh, percent. I just say, just make as much music as possible, and um, yeah, man, just keep keep producing, producing, producing as much music because it's never a bad thing. You're always gonna be better this month than yours last month, innit? If you if you if you're homing in on things and like picking out what you don't like and stuff like that. So yeah, man, just make tunes that you like, enjoy it as well, innit? Don't like force it. See so writing, just like stuff that's. Like, you know what I mean? Like we've all done it. Like if you write songs, you know what I mean. In it, like you end up just writing stuff that's just dead. But like you're doing it because you think, oh yeah, I'm writing a song. Do you know what I mean? But like take time with it. Do you know what I mean? Like look after it and that. Like, it's my baby. Like, I love that shit, man. Yeah, man. Uh, any more questions? Anyone? Uh, one more. Yeah, for call again. Um, where do you think the UK sounds gonna uh, gonna start going towards? Like, do you think drill's gonna be around for a much longer, or do you reckon do you reckon like Afro beats is gonna take over, or even perhaps the alternative rap scene? Um, that is a very good question. I think, yeah, personally, obviously, it's gone from grime, like the the like pirate radio type of sound, is turned into grime, and then it's kind of turned into drill. But I think nowadays it's it's getting a bit, it's getting a bit happier in it. Like it's getting more less. I'm gonna shoot you in your head, and more like let's just have a bit of fun and that. You know what I mean? Like with the say, like for example, A1 and J1. That's like that, that, that latest trend song. That song went crazy in it. I think it got number two or something. It's still drill, but it's like happy drill. Do you know what I mean? That type of thing. And yeah, obviously with um with the like Afro wave and stuff like that. I feel like that's picking up sick with the um the whiz kid people like that. And yeah, I feel like the um like the drill drill, like the like the hardcore like gang gang stuff and that I feel like that's kind of slowly fading out because that that can I feel like that can only last last for so long to be honest. I don't I like I like it in it. I listen to it daily, but I just I just think you can only go so far with saying how much you hate everyone and that, do you know what I mean? And I, I don't I feel like as as everyone grows up and that, because obviously it'll be like man like me or people younger listening to this, you get me? And then like obviously, no disrespect to, to the to the older man that listened to that, but like the, the more time we're not gonna be listening to that when we're when we're when we're big ages, do you know what I mean? And then yeah, I think it'll just it'll have its course and then um there'll be something new. There'll be there'll be a next genre. That, that's what's sick though, that's what I love because drill, I I like I wouldn't have imagined drill like when when Grime like like um JME was when he was like in his prime and that you get me stuff like that so then there'll be a next thing that comes out from 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 the streets and then that'll be its own thing and it'll just probably carry on like that forever in it because yeah man so yeah nice one bro um any more questions oh one there 
Hey, right. right. Um, yeah, my question is, um, say you've um, finished the track and then you go in to then release it, what would be the best way to sort of like market a self-release track? Like how would you spend like, you know, a small, medium, large budget on like pushing it out there and pushing your track so people actually hear it? Amber? Um, I think... Mm, obviously like if you're like really self-releasing it on Spotify with like a aggregator like um I think do a research into which one is best for that because um yeah and also you can like um pitch it to Spotify playlists which I think is really important um if you get a, a strong pitch and if you do like research into what they want to hear like it's it's a bit weird it's like they like to hear like specific things um, to, if they're going to consider your pitch. Um, so I think just doing research into that and also like research local music blogs and um, journalists like that, like, like on Twitter, like oh, there's loads of people like wanting to write, but like even from like interns at like the big like press things, if you, if you research that and just like send an email, they're like, normally more than happy to write about something. So yeah, I think that's important. Also upload to BBC Introducing. Oh yeah, please. also do that. <laughs> mm, yeah. Uh, any more questions? Yep, yeah, one back there. So we've got a microphone. Um, oh yeah, um, yeah, question for all of you on the panel. Um, if there was a song that you've heard recently that you wish that you had wrote and for what particular reasons, be curious to know what it was. Oh, that's a good question. That is a banging question. <laughs> One minute, let me get my phone out because I was thinking about this the other day. <laughs> wait, 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 wait. Like a recent song? Or uh, any song? It can ever. be recent or it could be something that's come back into, you know, recent fashion. Um, my answer would be there's a there's an artist called um, Josie Mann. She's from London, I think. Um, she wrote a song called Starry Skies, and I love that song at the moment. And that's like my my tune and that cry at home on my own to it and that. So proper, <laughs> it's a proper good one. So. Um, I don't know if this is recent, but just like anything by Dry Cleaning, I really like. I think their lyrics are insane. Um. And like really fresh, so yeah, just anything by them. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Um, probably anything. Every time Bill Callahan puts a record out, I think I love that. I wish I was Bill Callahan, but I can't. I can't express myself in so few words. <laughs> yeah, I wish I could write less. Uh, I, I wish I could uh, say more. Um, worth saying less but I just talk all the time and say loads of words and on that note I reckon we'll leave it there if you've got any more questions for anyone on the panel then I think we're all sticking around for a little bit um I'm not sure what's coming up next but I'm sure Whiskers will tell everyone thanks so much cheers cheers thanks Thanks, everyone. Um, so we've got our lunch break now, so we'll be back with the next panel at half past one. Um, there might be one or two slots left for me, the experts, if you want to try and book on. Uh, but if not, there's a bar. If you're not aware, there's a bar at the back of this room. There's a bar downstairs. Um, we'll see you back at half past one. Hello, hello. We're back. Hi, everyone. Congrats on making it back from lunch. I know it's always the kind of tricky bit in a day where you lose a few people, but it's nice to see so many people back. Um, my name is Jessica Williams, and I'm hosting today a panel on leading founders and freelancers. Um, everyone who joined us today does completely different things related to business. So hopefully, you'll really have an interesting chat about how you make it work, uh, the ups, the downs, all the good stuff. Um, and we're going to leave some time for questions at the end as well. So if you do have any burning thoughts, just hang on to them. We will get to them. Um, and we've got a microphone as well. So again, just sort of wait for your moment and we'll come around to you with the mic. So just to start with, really, I suppose the most logical place to start is for everyone to kind of do the blind date bit where you introduce yourself, where you're from, um, and what it is that you do. Harry, should we start with you? 
Sure. Hello. Um, <clears throat> so I, I'm Harry. Um, I live in Leeds. Um, I'm 28. <laughs> um, I am I, looking for. <laughs> <laughs> my ideal Sunday is I, um, <laughs> I uh, founded a uh, communications and events agency in Leeds called Hanglands. Um, I also used to run a festival in Leeds called High and Lonesome Festival. And um, <clears throat> yeah, I've been in the city for about 10 years um, as a promoter, a musician, a PR and every job in music going, basically. <laughs> You've given everything a go. <laughs> How about you, Sophie? Uh, hi there, everyone. My name's Sophie Cooper. Um, I'm based in Todmorden, which is a slap bag between Manchester and Leeds. Um, I've got lots of different roles, similarly to Harry, actually. Um, I'm here today primarily to talk about a festival that I self-organised with my partner uh, called Tour Festival. Um, I'm also uh, the learning lead for Huddersfield Contemporary Music Festival, and I'm an associate of Yorkshire Sound Women Network, and I'm also a musician, I'm a trombone player, a sound artist. Um, that's just the nature of DIY professional music activity these days, I think. Very much so, very much so. Um, Johnny. Hi, everyone. I'm Johnny Hooker. I run an organization in York uh, called Young Thugs. Um, that organization wears a few different hats, but primarily it's a recording studio. Um, it's a record label and talent development partner. We work with uh, EMI Records on that side. Um, we also put on very small niche bespoke events, um, kind of weird and wonderful things. And we run a stage at, and curate the music at Beat Herder Festival. Um, and finally, this is a new thing that we set up in lockdown. Um, we became a community organization um, to kind of formalize some of the things that we were doing, um, some of the community work that we were doing. Um, so we're running programs to help marginalize um, people in the music industry, particularly in music tech, because mm. um, it's such a male dominated industry. Um, and yeah, uh, talent development on that side as well for marginalized um, musicians. Yeah, sounds yeah, great. That's what we do. Um, and last but not least, Eva. Hi, I'm Eva. I'm the label manager at Come Play With Me, which is an artist development organization based in Leeds. I'm also the live events assistant at Long Division Festival based in Wakefield. I play in a band and I also set up Girls Do That Too, which is <clears throat> um, an organization where we just kind of create space for women and people of marginalized genders in music. Amazing. So. As you are hearing, a pattern is emerging. There's a lot of, and also, and also this, and also a bit of this. Um, and I'd really like to get into that, actually, uh, this kind of like multi-hyphenate tendency that I feel lots of us have now with work. Um, but maybe to start at this end and, and go back around, how did each of you actually get started doing what you were doing? Like, was it always an intention to do this kind of like freelancer founder thing? Or was it more of a kind of act of necessity um i mean like i started playing just as a kid mm. and then like i was lucky enough to have a parent who took me to like music conferences like this when i was like 13 14 wow yeah. <laughs> um, so i kind of started to get that understanding quite young mm. um and then it all kind of just like rolled into each other quite naturally like I started girls do that too at college because I was doing music tech and there just wasn't many girls doing it um and then like was putting on gigs and stuff and then did an event for come play with me which led into the internship which then rolled into what it is now so it all just kind of like rolled quite naturally yeah like sort of logical flow of <laughs> yeah yeah no yeah. I, I hear that I feel like it's been quite similar for me in that regard, like you sort of try a, a little bit of something and then it turns into another thing for sure. Mm. Um, how about you, Johnny? It sounds like you've started a lot of things very much like from kind of nothing level. Yeah, I think it actually, it stems back to being a musician. Um, mm. So I was a musician before I was in the music business. Um, and I kind of found that I became very good at multitasking because I was a musician um, yeah. and you have to, at the time when I was kind of signed and touring and, and doing that life, I found that I wasn't just creating music. I was also our marketing head 
and I was organizing the finances and I was making sure that the, early on, I was making sure that the tour worked and that we were everywhere on time. And I suppose you just develop a skill set. Um, I think it's still really relevant today in the music industry for, for musicians that are starting out that sometimes you have to be quite a lot of different things. Yeah. So I feel like that was where I got my schooling and, and grounding for kind of the many hats or the, the, the hats that I wear now. Um, yeah. So it just kind of, yeah, rolled on from there, I suppose. Yeah, so many hats, so many hats. Um, Sophie as well, you're massive multitasker. Uh, what came first? Um, I've been playing music all my life. Um, yeah. I've been playing trombone for about 25 years now, believe it or not. Um, so yeah, I was involved in music. And then after, when I went to, just before I went to university in Manchester, um, I got involved with a collective called Lady Fest uh, Manchester. We put on a festival there. I was 19 years old and totally clueless and just worked my way into the DIY kind of world that way. Um, and then after leaving university, just started promoting like weird DIY gigs here, there and everywhere. Came to Leeds a lot actually during that time as well. Um, and yeah, just carried on like that for ages, worked in offices, etc. And I guess it only became professional for me um, really about eight years ago I picked up some teaching music teaching um, and like I that has been invaluable to me because now I'm head of like teaching at a festival so I can have this regular part-time job alongside all my like freelance music composition composition practice as well so yeah so that's it basically muddling through right at the beginning is the way how I got onto it I'm sure Harry's laughing because he knows as well by something <laughs> Harry definitely knows <laughs> still muddling um <clears throat> no yeah, i can kind of round us off at 100 percent. my start was also a musician mm. um i kind of think of my like career in music as like a a very happy consolation prize to my not being a good enough <laughs> musician <laughs> um so i um yeah and, and so i kind of I, I i first started in my i could grow up in peterborough i didn't know anyone who worked in music there was no music industry there there was one venue yeah so I did a music tech course at college, which is ridiculous because I had no interest in music tech. So that's a good lesson is like just because a course has music in the title. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so I left that after a year and I ended up falling in with some with a label in London. Um, so I've been basically doing that ever since. Um, mm. But I guess to like bring it to like the founding point of view, like um, Cause like, I'm not a freelancer anymore. I'm like now a director of a business yeah. with a few members of the staff. Um, I've dropped a lot of the other stuff that I've done over the years and mm. now I've kind of taken it to this thing. So I've picked a few bits from that and turned that into a company. And then I've kind of dropped them. I'm not playing music anymore. Not for any like dramatic reason. I'm just not yeah. into it at it's the time, moment. Isn't yeah. It? I just not, just not, yeah. I've got no ideas at the moment. So I'm yeah. just not playing music. I'm not promoting shows. I've, so I've kind of, I've, I've spent, you know, 10 years or, or longer doing a different you know five different jobs and i and i know the last three years i've made an, a concerted effort to to run this business mm. <clears throat> and to kind of stop everything else and, and stuff so i kind of like everyone i think the same just doing everything take saying yes to everything that came along yeah. figuring out what i was good at what i wasn't what i liked and what i didn't and then and now I've got to the point where I'm trying to say, actually, I do this thing and I and that's what I do. And I'm going to be as best at that as I, as I can. Yeah. Sort of like flinging the net, I guess, wide to then pull it back in. Yeah. Also, it's incredibly hard to find paid work in the music industry. Like, I'm sure all of us have taken jobs we wouldn't have taken yeah. because you, you want to do it. You know, like, <laughs> you know, we still sometimes we, we work on stuff. I don't want to work on sometimes like you have to, yeah. especially in the pandemic. So, you know, if there's a job going as a, as a promoter and you maybe want to be in marketing, maybe it's OK to do that and yeah, take, take the work where you can. <laughs> I think often as well, like doing those things that maybe, you know, aren't the dream or doing those things that kind of like link tangentially to what you do want to do. Kind of a bit like you were saying with the teaching, kind of like creates a sort of empathy for the other moving parts of the industry that makes what you actually then do quite a lot easier um so like working as a writer i sort of feel like because i have done bits of pr i sort of know what a pr kind of has to deal with and how i might make their life a little bit easier or you know what i might need to ask or phrase or, or whatever so i feel like sometimes it can be worth kind of taking those little 
journeys to ultimately round out the thing you actually want to do, if that makes sense. Um, although I feel very left out because I've never been a musician. <laughs> No skill whatsoever. Less no star band. <laughs> There's no time. I think actually I I started because I wasn't a musician and it was just like how can I how can I justify my presence in all of these spaces otherwise? Um, yeah, I think a lot of the like modern career, <clears throat> like the modern career in music, relies on you being a facilitator for a lot of different stuff. I think, yeah. um, you know. So Eva and I work together on, so we, my company looks after press and social media and marketing for long divisions. We work together on that. Mm. We do the same for Come Play With Me, so we work together on that. And, and you know, you everyone's wearing people, these different yeah. things and, you know, you have to kind of pull these different things together. And I think a lot of it is about saying, <clears throat> a lot of it, yeah, a lot of it is about facilitating people and taking people from one part of your life and introducing them to another part of your, and yeah. bringing that all together. And I think there's like, yeah, being able to, <clears throat> yeah, especially when things are so scrappy as they are at the minute, to be able to pull different things together and say, actually, I know someone at a label, I can help out with that. Or I've got a friend who, who's opening yeah. a pressing plant, or I've got a friend who does this, you can pull things together. And a good way to do that is to work with mm. tons of people. Super group forming constantly. <laughs> yeah. yeah, even I were talking before lunch about collaboration. Um, and mm. I guess that's kind of an important networking and collaboration. And I, I kind of realized... Um, thankfully quite early on into Young Thugs that collaboration is, is, was really the key to us taking that business where we wanted to take it. And it's not necessarily that you're in competition with anyone. Yeah. We should all raise each other up together. So particularly in the North, I think there's a whole wealth of talent. There's a whole wealth of talented uh, related businesses and people doing great stuff. And we don't have to necessarily feel like we're in competition, um, even though you might be. Yeah, but it's there's kind of like there's a subtle undertone there as well, which is like if we all do good stuff, then let's work on it together. Absolutely, um, I think that's a really important thing to shed early on. This sort of fear that if you know if you befriend someone, that they're gonna like do you over. Yeah. <laughs> it's like it it does. I mean, I'm sure it does happen sometimes, but it never happens as much as you imagine it might. Um, did any of you? kind of have like a mentor situation or like somebody at a kind of pivotal point in what you were doing that really did help to kind of take it to that next level where it was becoming more of a job constantly and you did yeah um well definitely just literally being trained like to teach music being trained to play the trombone you know going into jobs having great bosses uh speak putting on a band having you know great relationship with them communication we're all mentoring each other in a way you yeah. know I hate to sound like a complete hippie about it but like um you know we're getting like little bits of money in from everywhere and I, I, I really agree with what you were just saying there Johnny about like just raising each other up I think anyone who feels like they're in a competition particularly in the north actually isn't going to last that long I used to live in London and it did happen down there and I, I didn't feel very supported as a musician or a promoter came back up here and suddenly it was just like how can I help you and there's actually existing networks that you can join as well particularly in promotion where you are linked with other people in the country and say a band's coming to the UK you can all get together and um, say okay they play Leeds that night Manchester next night and I'm constantly speaking to other promoters so about the situations like that to help each other so I think in terms of like a mentor I've had strict mentors I've had like paid mentors before yeah. but on a general day-to-day -day, I'm taking so much from everybody all the time and just like now yeah I, I think this thing about like being a musician, being a teacher, being a promoter, it's just all the extension of one practice. Mm. And that's how I see like all my roles now in the music industry, because ultimately my passion is music, you know? So, and that's, that's really what I keep coming back to. It's just like a value really. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> definitely. <laughs> just, I agree completely with that. Um, just to add to it, I think the role of a mentor can be, it can be quite subtle as well. It doesn't have to be like you going to sit down with somebody and, and them telling yeah. you how you're going to do better. Like just communicating and having conversations with people that are in your industry and finding out what they're doing and learning about their, their, their activity. And that can be the same for bands, like just talking to bands when you're, when you're out and about on tour and asking them what they're doing and who they're working with and what they found to be successful and, and where they're getting good results. Yeah. I'll, I'll kind of make it feel like they're making headway. Um, so it can be a, it can be quite a subtle thing, I think, having a mentor. It can be just talking and learning. Definitely. 
Yeah, I think the, <clears throat> again, the mental thing of that kind of, that fluid relationship you can have where someone can, someone can offer you guidance and then you can offer them guidance and things like that. And I think like, that's an important, <clears throat> that's an important skill or, I don't know if it's a skill, but having the like emotional maturity, emotional awareness to manage the fact that you'll find in your career in the music industry, especially in the North, probably and definitely as a freelancer, every relationship you have is, is blurry, right? I mean, <clears throat> you're friends with the people you work with, you're friends with the artists you work with, you work with artists who are in relationships with someone who runs that label or you work with whatever and, and every relationship is incredibly blurry and fluid mm -hmm. you know like Janessa you and I are friends and we, we are we are friends <laughs> um and i would like to see you on saturday for a pint at live at leeds as my yes, friend let's do that but i would also like you to review the band i'm working with on saturday harry, and <laughs> harry would also really like me to respond to his emails yeah I'm sure. so yeah. but this is but this is this is what i'm saying it's an incredibly blurred yeah. it's an incredibly fluid and, and blurry relationship and every relationship you have and it's about and i think it's about having emotional awareness and respect yeah. To, to know that like someone who is your friend does not have time to reply to your emails and it doesn't mean that they're not your friend. And like, I think that's like a, that's a big part of it. Do you know what I mean? And like, the, so sometimes someone can be your mentor and then, and then a week later they really need a massive favor from you. And I think yeah. like the, and I think one of the things from, from making it as a freelancer or a founder or whatever is, is about being able to manage a complex network of fluid relationships and, and knowing, and then at your basis, you're working with creative complex people as well. A huge amount of managing your career as a freelancer is managing the relationships you have in your life. I really feel that's quite important. And, and especially if you were to be doing it in, in Leeds or West Yorkshire or the North, you are also managing a, a small, it's a small pond. You know, isn't it really? Yeah. There aren't many really, of us. It really is. It really is. I think that's so right. And I think, I think I've fallen into the trap when I was younger of kind of feeling like, you know, I couldn't ask people questions or, you know, oh, I can't take out, I can't take up their time because I've got nothing to offer them. But I think especially, you know, when you're starting out, often people are very, very flattered just to be asked quite a lot of the time. Um, and I think often even if you think you've got nothing to kind of offer that conversation, people sometimes like to hear the perspective of people younger than them or newer, um, you know, thinking about things in different ways or sort of refreshing what they do in some ways. So there's almost always a way that that exchange can be mutually beneficial, almost always. I think you're totally right there. Yeah. Um, one of the things I've, I've realized is that I, I like to help people, and I guess that's why I've ended up here. And, and maybe um, this isn't unique to me. Well, it definitely isn't. But if somebody asks me for help, my answer to that is always going to be yes, if I can. Yeah. And I have the time. And I realize that that works the other way around. So if I, if I need some help with something, and, and you're right, the fear, you, imposter syndrome is, is kind of rife, isn't it? And I sometimes think, Sorry. I can't talk to this head of this thing, this big conglomerate. They're not, gonna, they're not interested in my little community project. Yeah. But actually, they, they really are. Yeah. And if you ask, then what's the worst that can happen? They, they might say no, but invariably they're gonna say yes. Absolutely, I think um, it goes back to what you were saying really about like remembering that everyone is just people and like treating people like they're people. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've, I had like a, um, so I, I start, so when I first started in music, I was really, really young. I was like 16 or 17 and <clears throat> I made friends with this label and everyone was 10 years older than me. Mm -hmm. Everyone was, there were some people there in like, jet, in like bands playing arenas and selling murder records. And I was a fucking nightmare, I imagine. Like just asking for favors and like, why can't you take me on tour? <laughs> Not understanding that there's a label that have their own interests and there's an agency that have their own interests and everything else. And like, I did find it incredibly like freeing and liberating in my career to understand that like, no one's doing as well as you think they are. No. No one really knows what they're doing. No. And it's all fine. It's and all as soon as I realized that, then I was like, oh, this is fine. Yeah. You can approach anyone, you can do it as long as you, you know. So I found that to be like a freeing thing. But for like the, the hardest lesson I think I've ever learned was like, people are not, you know what I mean? I'm like, why aren't you coming to this gig? And because they're, they're playing five aside that night. And they're like yeah. put on some weight and they want to get fit again. So they're not coming to the gig. But you just think, well, everyone wants to be at a gig all the time, don't they? Yeah. 
that was a that was a hard that was a hard one a hard taught lesson i think for me i remember like being younger like yeah one of the, one of the first few gigs i put on a friend of mine i guess he was a mentor in a way and he said to me don't expect any of your friends to come to this gig so just like <laughs> give those fires to literally everybody you see and i did and i think that's really good advice actually I stand by that but um yeah. doing it yourself just do it. yeah i think that's what you mean doesn't it like don't expect to be help other people in a way just crack on yeah just crack on is is definitely very solid. The advice. the diminishing return of friends and families coming to gigs is uh <laughs> it's, it's rough in it. The amount of bands like I used to work at a venue and they'd say we sold a hundred tickets at Porto and I'm like yeah, that's great but do that again. <laughs> well, this is the thing, isn't it? Like it's it's said over and over, but I think as a musician, remembering that your friends and family are are your friends and family and not your fan base is a really important distinction. <laughs> really important distinction you know they cannot sustain your entire being um something even i were talking about before was like this nature of doing so much all the time and constantly like a bit of this bit of that you know constantly darting around the place like either how do you actually manage the logistics of kind of like doing all of these things giving them all the care and the attention that they need and that you want to give them, but also like having a life? Um, see, I think the kind of stuff that I'm doing is often what I'd be doing anyway yeah. if it wasn't work. Yeah. So like with the whole gig thing, like if I wasn't putting on a gig, I'd be at a gig. Yeah. So it kind of is the same thing, mm. which definitely isn't going to be a great thing long term, but <laughs> <laughs> right now it's working. So, yeah. But yeah. Yeah. How do you all find that in terms of like, I suppose I've often felt that sort of burden of realizing that I've turned everything that I felt, felt was fun into like work. And obviously it brings a lot of joy, but simultaneously it does kind of mean that you maybe can't go to a gig without thinking about what you'd write about it, or you can't, you know, sort of listen to an album without kind of thinking, oh, well, how would I market this? I think I think when you're so wrapped up in, in what you do, yeah, and, and I guess freelancers generally tend, hopefully, to choose something that they love. And you're right, and obviously that can then become a little bit of a, a burden sometimes. But I think it's just really, I was talking to a friend of mine who runs uh, Soundsphere magazine this morning. I don't know if you know Dom Smith. Um, and he was like, I said, how are you doing? He's like, I'm just really tired. I'm really tired. And I said, look, you work really hard. You need to remember to actually have a break. Yeah. Um, and, and I guess that's how I manage it, is to just remember to be able to turn off um, now, whether my family would say I actually do that or not, it could be a completely different thing. But Yeah, it's difficult, isn't it? Because I feel like sometimes hard work is kind of seen as like such a badge of honour that it's almost like, oh, I'm absolutely knackered. I must be doing it right when like not necessarily. <laughs> Can I? Yeah, um, I guess it. it I guess there's quite a bit of planning that goes into my, into my personal yeah. situation. Um, like I'm, I'm knocking on 40, so I've been doing this for quite a while now. And like... I, I consciously have taken a part-time job that pays my bills and then I do freelance work around it. But I'm also very good at saving money. So when I don't have much money coming in that month, I do look at my bank balance and I, I do have a little bit of savings. So I, I do kind of like budget really carefully to mm -hmm. allow for myself to have time off and also to allow for myself to go in and go to other people's gigs like you, like you started this conversation off with and just enjoy that experience yeah. and where I live in Todmorden it's it's semi-rural if you've not been there um I, when I first moved there there weren't many gigs going on there so I've made a real effort to like reach out to community and support people to put on gigs so I don't have to do that and one of the big reasons I do it in my town in Todmorden is because the trains going back from Leeds to Manchester um go at like 9 30 so it's impractical for me to go to yeah. concerts so like that's why we do it in Todd so I'm very happy for other people to put on gigs and I'll do everything I can to support them in that you know what I mean yeah. so yeah I have to, like I've like taken conscious steps and decisions in my life to kind of facilitate downtime if that makes sense but yeah. it's, it's it took a, it took a while it took a few years yeah the way I manage it is that I'm tired all the time. Same. Um, <clears throat> just, uh, just, just ten years, just ten years into burning myself down to a nub, I think. But um, no, I think it's. Uh, I think like I think what Eva said is like is <clears throat> is spot on. But also I think where 
you as a as a worker or a professional in the music industry are really open to having your time and your and your energy abused by people because everybody is doing this because they love it because everybody could be making more money doing something else um and there is an emotional investment in in your music or working with people's music you know if you're working on a record someone's trusting you with their art you know that's a that's a serious thing um or at least it's a serious thing if you care about that kind of stuff which we all do um so i think the fact is like where i don't really have a solution for this but i think where where people are like able to <clears throat> to really abuse your time and your money or, or whatever, or how much they pay you is the fact that you love it and you'll be doing it anyway. Yeah. And there's this constant threat. They're like, oh, there's 500 other people behind you with, with money from their parents and they'd do it for free. And you're lucky to be here. And it's a, that's, a, that's another kind of you know, thing to slay on your, on, your way, on your way to do that, to actually say that you are, you're, you're not lucky to be here. This is a job and you're, you're good at it. And I do think that thing of like, well, if you're going to be at the show anyway, so we're not going to pay you to be here. Well, no, fuck that. You know, like that's the, that, that's the thing um, that I think is quite, that makes freelancing as well, especially difficult, you know? Um, but yeah. And then in terms of like time as well, like Johnny, I don't know if you found this, like I started as a freelancer, so I had to manage my workload, but now I'm managing like, payroll and pensions yeah. and big boy stuff yeah and yeah and hr and other stuff on top of everything else and it's like that was never the never the plan and it's more to do and then you end up when you fall into stuff like we all do you know we all I'll do this i'll do this i'll do this you suddenly end up in this place where you're going oh you know i, I don't have time to do this i don't have time to go to this show because i'm deciding which pension fund we're going to use and i'm going <laughs> to you know i'm going to do whatever and so you can kind of you can lose you know and go in different ways very quickly. Yeah, yeah. I feel like um, you've sort of touched on something there, which I think is the greatest joy of freelancing, which I think sometimes it's very easy to forget. But the kind of real perk of freelancing is that you can say no to stuff and you can prioritise the stuff that you do really care about. Um, and I think I've definitely been, been guilty of forgetting that that was sort of the appeal in the first place. And actually, if something's not for me, I can go... Nah. money permitting obviously um from all of your perspectives what would you say is the real like i mean we'll balance it out the real perk of working this way and the real kind of challenge of working this way like what are the, the ups and downs in comparison to kind of having the sort of job where you do just go into an office and answer specifically to someone I'm not very big, good at being told what to do. Um, so yeah. I kind of, I, I guess that's one of the reasons that I navigated towards being um, a freelance entrepreneur. Um, so, but I, the perk for me is that, uh, a bit like Harry, I suppose, and Eva and Sophie, I'm, I'm a kind of working with a great team now. Um, and, and we've put a lot of hard work into building something up. Um, and I can sort of, the perk for me right now is that we're currently doing really well. And I love and I love going to work, and I never feel like I'm at work. I remember my grand. This is a bit soppy, but I remember my granddad saying to me, like 15 years ago, when I was really sort of wrestling with whether to uh, go into the music industry or go into another industry, um, and he just sat me down and said, "You just need to do what you love," um, and I'll remember that until I die. And I know it is a bit soppy, but I've held on to that, yeah. and and all the, the the days where I'm working 15 hours. I just have to sometimes take a little moment and think, oh, well, I'll try and remember that because I do love this. Mm. Um, and, and so that's the perk for me right now. It's a classic for a reason. Yeah. <laughs> um, I quite, my, I mean, mine keeps shifting like yeah. all the time, but at the moment, the thing that I quite like about what I do um, and that I think, <clears throat> and what the people that we, we work with or that, we, that I'm friends with in, in, in Leeds especially is like, is this, and I think this is a very specific Leeds point as well. Like, I don't think this even applies to Manchester or or, another, or Liverpool, but I don't think, I think Leeds' is, music industry is in a kind of ascendant place, but it's not yeah. really been as big as it's, as our, as our other cities. Mm -hmm. 
um, in terms of <clears throat> just in terms of jobs, in terms of out, jobs outside of live. I mean, yeah. in terms of record labels or agencies or whatever or booking agencies, you know that it's we don't have a particularly strong industry or, or it's one that's growing. We have one that's growing, and the thing that's really exciting to me at the moment is the is we have the ability to grow to build this industry in our own image or in the image of the way we feel it ought to be and i think there's an element of like there's a possibility actually to install instill a working culture in the city that is healthier that is more positive that is more representative and i think actually the fact that we don't have that stuff yet is actually really is that is yeah. actually can be a really positive thing and you know yeah, and i think like him. yeah i think it's the same for musicians as well leeds has never had that massive band that is an albatross for everyone else that manchester bands Controversial. W- but, the, <laughs> but they've had yeah we've had we've had big we've had big bands but there's no there's no oasis or arctic monkeys you know that like is a there's no lead sound right i don't think people can compare can, can think of one particular thing when they think of leads mm. um so i think yeah i think there's an opportunity that's the thing that is exciting to me is this opportunity to kind of like like either you can take come play with me in the direction that you feel a label should be and Absolutely. that's incredibly powerful and i think that's ace that's that's what i'm yeah. excited about yeah no that's a super good point yeah see like on that like my journey into being a freelancer happened extremely quickly Mm. and like I dropped out of uni and then it all just kicked off yeah so I feel like I've not it's kind of just all washed over me and just happened like I've never had like an opportunity to just sit back and be like oh this happened yeah this is like like, a practical move yeah yeah so but it's like Harry said like the fact that there's that control over you can take something where you want it to be and you know it's amazing yeah and like to be able to be trusted to do that as well is yeah mind-blowing yeah yeah i think on the back of that as well um from a sort of curatorial point of view um supporting artists to um create their vision is really inspiring and really important to my practice as a promoter um definitely but uh freelancing um it's a big thing for me positive is time management um mm. i like to be able to work you know maybe i'm grafting like this weekend i'm going to bristol i'm going to be performing on saturday sunday so i'll work really hard and then maybe i'll take monday tuesday off you know what i mean so yeah. I, I quite like having my control over my diary uh it sounds like a really boring uh <laughs> like operations kind of manager but you kind of have to be though when you're freelancing and my diary's like a bit you know a bit of a battleship and like we're doing this and all the things are color-coded but like taking that time to kind of like um you know uh, organize yourself is really crucial to making it work you're just going to lose your mind basically um absolutely but yeah yeah Um, i guess that's the thing with like i suppose with working creatively as well is that it's hard to like it's hard to be creative nine to five, 10 to six, whatever, yeah, five days a week. And like, and things are going to hit you at different points. And I suppose it, it gives you the opportunity, you know, if you're curating something, it gives you the opportunity to say, actually, it's nine o'clock on a Monday morning and I do not want to listen to a load of new stuff, but maybe on a Friday night you get inspired. And it's something I say to like the people that work with me at Hanglands, they're like, oh, I can't write this press release. And I'm like, yeah, well, it's creative writing. You can't just say, I'm going to be creative now yeah. for 45 minutes until I finish this press release. And I think that's like a, an element. Things hit you, don't they, at different points and whatever. And I think it gives you, being a creative freelancer gives you even more freedom to to do better work because you can work when it hits you yeah yeah as long as you've got nice people giving you reasonable deadline <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> which i feel sometimes with with freelance work they something i've kind of encountered is having to kind of make it clear to people that just because you're freelance and you're flexible doesn't mean that you don't have some boundaries i've sort of found some clients maybe forgetting but because i'm freelance i don't just sort of sit twiddling my thumbs waiting for the call from them to do this really big thing um so kind of like managing people's expectations again comes back to all that stuff about talking to people like they're people being honest being straightforward all that good stuff can we talk about rates and money please do Please do talk cold hard cash. I'd be really interested. 
Oh, you mean actually like not specific? No, no. This is the you this is the me a job. Yeah. We negotiated. <laughs> but I mean, like, I'd be really interested to get everyone else's takes on like I don't know. We had a job recently where I thought we got it because our pitch was really good. Right. It turns out just massively under <laughs> massively underquoted, and and the problem is no one will ever tell. I mean, I'm not going to tell you what we charge because we don't have a culture of that yet. Yeah. But I don't think it would be a bad thing, but. I just think that I, I'm just really interested because I don't think anyone, there is no set rate for anything. No one will ever tell you what their budget is. No one will ever do that. So you end up doing a lot of work for less money than you maybe should yeah. do. And yeah. and I'm just, I'm just interested as well, Janessa, how you handle that as well because there's no set rate. Yeah. And other journalists aren't telling you what they're getting paid, are they? It's been a real journey in terms of like getting up the self-worth to sort of be like no that is not enough um most places i write for do have set rates so it is kind of a say yes or see you later situation um most of them i've genuinely been quite pleasantly surprised at um kind of asking for things and getting them um, I think as a general rule, anyone starting out in writing should always ask for more money than they think is is reasonable for the thing itself. Because uh, I've frequently been surprised, like, oh, that was my top offer. I would have gone lower, but all oh, right, you're giving me it. Oh, cool, thanks. Um, but I agree with you in terms of the transparency thing. And I think actually it's been really nice to see in music journalism, particularly around, actually kind of during the pandemic, like, and around Twitter, a lot more of kind of like, ask me a quest a direct question and I'll give you a direct answer. Um, and I don't know if that's sort of like branching out into other aspects of music business, but with writing, um, there's tons of really good, like, it <laughs> sounds a bit dodge, but like anonymous Excel spreadsheets kind of doing the rounds that sort of do have like a publication. Here's what I, you know, here's what they offered me. Here's what I went back with. Here's what they said, all anonymous. Mm -hmm but you can kind of like get access to these things and then sort of figure out where you're at. Um, that has been totally invaluable, totally. I think it's really interesting. I think we can all be responsible for, for this subject matter yeah. by, by paying people properly when you have the budget to yeah. do so. And, and not just being honest. About yeah. It, Cause know? we're not, we've yeah. historically, we're not great at this in the music industry. I don't think that's why we're still paying young bands with beer, which is like not good for anyone's mental health. Like put some worth on that and yeah. actually give them a proper fee mm -hmm. if you can afford it within the ticket structure. There's, there's, there's two points I'd like to make. Oh, well, they're actually the same point. We were talking earlier about how at the beginning there can be a tendency to say yes to everything. Yeah. When you're starting out on a freelance career, you might kind of think, well, okay, where is the next job coming from? I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna say yes to that. And that can be a really effective strategy, but I think there's also a flip side to that, mm -hmm. which is know your worth and set a pricing that works for you in your life mm -hmm. at that particular time and yeah you might it doesn't have to be a hard and fast rule that you never break but if you suddenly say okay this is my worth and i'm not going to do that job for less than 250 pounds a day or whatever you set as that thing yeah and you start saying no to jobs which can be hard mm -hmm. it can be a real discipline to say no to something what what i found is that actually then the next thing that comes along, you might have turned something down and you think, oh God, why did I do that? I should have just taken that. That that 80 quid was great. I could have definitely made that work. Yeah. But actually the time that you were going to devote to that 80 quid job, all of a sudden something pops up that mm -hmm. is more in the bracket that you've set yourself. So I think there's a, a perception in terms of pricing as well, in terms of, okay, yeah. well, let's, if I'm aiming for this type of customer, then I've got a price for that type of customer. It definitely depends as well with where you're at because, you know, I've speaking only for myself here, like I've worked at this long enough now that I do kind of trust in myself that me delivering a feature that you're not going to have to edit much, you're not going to have to do much with is worth more maybe than something that needs lots and lots of work. And I don't think it's unreasonable to sort of put it to people you're working with in the sense that you're not paying only for my time, but you're paying for the experience that I've accumulated to do this job in a way that makes your life easier your skill too. skill set. Yeah, so like on the flip side, I think when you are starting out, maybe there is a degree of like realism in the sense that, okay, you know, what I'm getting out of this might not be the best money, but hopefully I'm working with someone who is going to teach me how to get better and teach me how to sort of, to really use business speak, like grow a product that is worth the higher fee that you're trying to get. Yeah. 
if that makes sense. Yeah, I, I, I totally, totally agree. Um, I think in self-organizing though, in gigs, um, well, talking talk about like live music, gigs, etc. like I didn't, I still don't get paid from the festival that I self-organize. Yeah. Um, and I'm actually okay with that because I have other jobs which pay for my day-to-day -day life and more like my my professional career or whatever and I, but I still get so much out of yeah. that free time organizing my festival I put on events regularly as well um mainly because I want to see the bands um yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. like it can be that simple but also the networking that you get out of the of that like playing bands and for me as a performer as well if someone's touring around the UK I put them on mm. I'll, they'll put me on you know there's that nice like network of like DIY promoters across yeah. country so I don't know I think I think there are times when you can you can make that choice to like yeah. do something for the passion of it as well I think that I think that is still really important yeah I think it's sort of just being clear what you're getting out of it isn't yeah. it like it doesn't have to be money it can yeah. be whatever is important to you but just being clear on what that is when you enter into whatever it is the thing that you're doing yeah and i think uh, part of that is having a fluid pricing structure as well you know we've yeah. just been able to drop we've just been able to drop some prices we're charging independent bands for albums next year because we've just taken on something that's a bit more corporate that's mm. paying like a big whack over yeah. what we normally charge so we're kind of able to pass that that's just our that's a kind of a personal thing from our point of view but mm. for us it feels like well if this is what we need to to bring in and if we can bring in this much from something that's a bit more corporate we can reduce these prices so it's a bit easier for bands and stuff so i think it's about choosing but because that's what we want to do and that's what we take value from and whatever so i think it's like you know what you're doing but yeah. just to follow up on what you said about experience i think it's like again as you go <clears throat> knowing your experience but then it's knowing your experience later on and i think like it's something we get a lot um we get a lot doing like pr for stuff because mm. <clears throat> if you and it's about having it's about having the the I don't know the confidence i suppose in yourself to say well, actually what i'm doing is 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 worth this much money because i say well you had you only spent an afternoon on that and it's like yeah but it doesn't matter because you're going on results so I've worked 10 years to yeah yeah exactly just exactly <laughs> so if they if they say if they say to me okay well we want you to do this job and we have you know 1500 pounds to pay for it and we want to be in the guardian and i can do that in one email why is that le why is that worse value yeah. than if I spent days ringing them and saying please pick up the phone? Yeah. It's not if the product is the, if the thing is worth it and you have that kind of experience to do stuff and so I think it's a part of knowing knowing what you know, like knowing your experience and mm. and getting out of the mindset of hours worked. Yeah. Because yeah. very few of the jobs we all do are to do with hours worked. You know. Yeah. Um, whether you're if you're curating something and you have a really strong relationship with a booking agent you can bring in a really decent headliner for something mm. because they trust you because you've spent 10 years working with them on another festival or something that is worth money and the fact that that didn't take you days and days of badgering their assistant does yeah. not mean it's less valuable the opposite really it's an interesting one I've been thinking about a lot recently because um, I not always but like have had experiences of suffering quite badly with anxiety and I found that when I cost for a job, I almost have to cost for the hours spent writing, but then also like the hours of emotional labor around the thing itself. And it sounds ridiculous, but like, if you're gonna spend an, in, an, an hour interviewing someone, but you're gonna lose three days of your life to like being so anxious and prepping and doing all the rest of it. Like, it's not necessarily saying like, oh, you know, this is your problem, you have to pay me for it. But like, you have to be mindful almost when you're figuring out how much to take on, like how you kind of are as a person and like whether that thing that you say yes to because it's an afternoon is actually gonna obliterate your entire week because, you know, you have no headspace for anything else, so. I feel like freelancing, founding, all of this stuff comes back to like having a really good awareness of yourself, which kind of again only really comes about by just giving things a go and seeing what happens. And that just gets easy with experience, yeah. I think. Yeah. Yeah, it really does. Can you work around the, the anxiety now? <laughs> Can you place it to like. Well, it's like anything, isn't it? It gets better the more you yeah. do it. Yeah. But, um, and it depends what the thing is. Like, it's not. Um, nothing mental health related is ever linear is it but and it's not even like a, you know i now have to say no to things or anything like that or i have to you know tell people that it's it's causing me trouble or anything it's just more that 
making sure, like Sophie was saying, when you're sort of planning out that calendar that you are accounting for emotional labor as well as practical labor, I think, um, is the very rambly point I was trying to make. Um, to kind of think, I suppose, about like where we point all of this stuff, um, I was really taken by what you were saying about the fact that we're in this really nice position where we can kind of decide what we want this thing to look like because there's never been anything that's come first. Um, so if we hang on to that idea, like what sort of things do we all want to see kind of either change or improve around the perception of freelancing, founding, small business running, you know, all of this kind of like DIY approach to music in Yorkshire? Big old question. <laughs> what, uh, I'll answer this in a hopefully a succinct, but probably not way. <laughs> One of the things that I try and do within within young folks, particularly on the educational and community side, is to um, try and demystify the music industry a little bit, mm. um, and try and empower young people to think, well, actually, this is this is a real option for me. Um, an example is I recently, we have a, a studio in a working men's club um, and we're just doing a huge refurb um, and we've moved it onto a barge um, at the same, it's amazing. Onto a barge? Yeah, onto wow. a barge, 180 uh, foot barge, old coal barge on the river in, in York. It's amazing. It's, it's getting a bit cold now though, but it's, yeah. uh, we've only got four weeks left. But at the same time, we're running a program to uh, empower women and non-binary people in music tech because I found out in lockdown that there's um, less than 3% representation which mm. i was kind of pretty appalled at as a as a father of a of a daughter of a girl um and my point is demystification of the music industry is something i'd like to see continue happen particularly within music tech and recording studio and record label environments um when i was moving the studio from the working men's club into the barge the three um candidates and producers um they're all women um and they helped helped with that move and at the end of one of the days, um, one of the producers said to me, you could make a studio anywhere, couldn't you? And I was like, that is exactly the point. Like you, and, and this is specifically for recording studio environments. And I almost think that's probably greater than any of the lessons that we could have given them or any of the teaching. Mm -hmm. the, the, the taking away the fear of giving it a go was such a big kind of, I could see the penny drop. And I was like, that's exactly right. You could go back to Leeds and you could find a space and you don't need loads of money and you don't need loads of uh, equipment you just need a small idea and some energy and i yeah. could and and i'm almost certain that she'll go on and, and and do that now um which i feel really proud of so my point is that demystification of what we do and anyone can give it a go i think and i'd like to see that continue in our region um we've got loads of great businesses i'd like us you know we were talking about competition yeah let's come compete with the south let's let's do that let's get it we're away from... nicer than the south i mean I, like you can tell i'm i'm very southern i'm never going back but i want to go there the london -cent centric nature of the music industry is something that i, I, I kind of try and fight against because i think yeah. we've got so much talent up here and if we could just move the eye up north then, then let's try and do that Completely. yeah i think talent retention sorry, oh, sorry. I think talent retention is an interesting thing as well. Like mm. I, <clears throat> there was no, there was no possibility of me living where I grew up and working in the music industry, and I had to leave. Yeah. And I think that's a shame. I mean, it wasn't a hard decision to leave <laughs> Peterborough if you've ever been there, or Stevenage, no. or Stevenage. <laughs> but still, you should be afforded the option to. Yeah stay where you grew up if you want to and i think that's the thing that i feel quite strongly about here is that like <clears throat> you actually can make this work mm. you can have a career up here and you can have a satisfying career up here and a, and a meaningful one and yeah. and i think the talent retention thing is really is really important and i think making people feel that actually there are there are pathways and there are routes and and frankly like the the only well, not the only, sorry, the best way to do that is to create jobs. Yeah. yeah. I think like everything else, everything else, ultimately, we just need to create more jobs. Mm. Because if you can create jobs and you can put people in those jobs, they can pay their rent, they can stay here yeah. and they can grow with it. And I think that's a, <clears throat> that's a huge thing that I think we, we, 
we need and i think you know there are there are things that are happening that are helping that i think come play with me's um come play with me's kind of masterful uh use of funding applications that they use to for the greater good of the city is, is fantastic you know creating yeah. youth music creating jobs and long division in wakefield creating jobs with youth music funds and things like that so there are things happening um yeah. but i think the talent retention is one and i think as well we have an opportunity in terms of the in in terms of the greater representation of the music industry up here we have an opportunity here to like put our money where our mouth is in a way that as a and as a freelancer or a founder and i don't in a way that's maybe a bit harder if you worked at universal or something um i was listening to uh i was listening to radio 4 in the car yesterday and they were talking about what i think they called a meritocracy mm. which is that you only hire people that look like you yeah yeah um and we have an opportunity to not do to not have a meritocracy we have an opportunity if you can create a job through your freelance career cast the net out don't hire your mate yeah. and i think we have an opportunity in terms of increasing the representation increasing the fairness of the music industry in the north to actually do it again yeah. we're going back to building it in our own image we can actually do it you can't change the hiring process at universal music group unless you are a director at universal music group you can at your own company if you start it yeah. and so i think that's something that i i want to see just more job creation more support for small businesses yeah. and you know that that would be great and i think to yeah to to connect things a little more up here as well definitely I think that's quite an inspiring point to end on, Harry. I'm a very inspiring <laughs> man. You are. <laughs> I can't believe you just said that. But um, yeah, fr freelancing, I feel, is a really, like, I, I really appreciate what you just said in the sense that I think people are <laughs> starting to cotton on to the fact that, you know, they do want perspectives outside of London. And I know I've had tons of work come through because people are starting to cotton on to the fact that, you know, they don't just want white Southerners to talk about things. They don't just want to hear from that perspective. Um, so actually, I think in a weird sort of way, it's never been a better time to start something, give it a go. Um, we've rambled a wee bit, but I want to leave a couple of minutes for questions. Um, did anyone have one i don't know how you can top i am an incredible man <laughs> any questions at all right if nobody has a question i'm gonna have a question you do it uh... hello <laughs> um <laughs> If you're a artist that has plenty of material and you're thinking about recording, how do you find somebody like a producer to record with? And then after you record the, uh, you record the first album, would you say release it on your own or go to somebody, show it around and hope that somebody will say, oh, that's actually really good? Yeah, that's a really, I know that's a simple question, but there's a really complicated <laughs> answer to that. Um, I'll take it. A bit of it and then i'll pass it on we could break it up couldn't <laughs> we, we to recording half half? label <laughs> yeah first <laughs> external there you go <laughs> yeah we'll go through the life cycle of uh, yeah, releasing yeah. A, a single um in terms of recording just um and finding a producer like look around listen speak to bands in your area find out who's going to be within your budget find out who's nice find out who you're going to have fun with and he's not going to be too much of a sort of dictator. Can I jump uh, in as well? Yeah. You should contact the Yorkshire Sound Women Network who have a massive pool of uh, female uh, and non-binary uh, producers. There you go. Just for an example, I'm sure there's like <laughs> loads of networks out there, but Yorkshire Sound Women Network are really great. <laughs> no, I agree. <laughs> but yeah, well just made. kind of get out there and, and speak to bands that you like or try and like if you hear something on Spotify or other music platforms are available um like just try and do a bit of digging and find out who produced that that's yeah. that's what i would do it's ask questions again isn't it all, yeah. all things are just flat out ask like stuff that you like the sound of who worked on that stuff that you know who worked on that i was just going to say getting your track out though like no don't underestimate radio play um, I know you had Emily Pillbeam here earlier, like someone from BBC introducing, like 
it's really powerful. So definitely try and get radio play through avenues like that. Yeah, and I think like when you're sending it to labels, like you shouldn't feel like you have to like um what's the word if they say no when it's not right for them then still do it like it's not just because they don't like it doesn't mean no one else is gonna like it yeah, yeah it's be, not suddenly be thick worthless. Skin. <laughs> yeah. i remember when i was a musician i had a rule that if there was a, a room of 10 people if one of them liked it then i was winning that was i'd yeah. won the lottery with that so like yeah dealing with rejection is is a is a thing isn't it yeah. don't give up no absolutely <laughs> I think it's um it's no like uh, as an independent artist as well it's knowing yourself and your strengths and weaknesses and your skill sets as well you know I think <clears throat> especially when it comes to having made the thing you know um, I know a friend of mine <clears throat> who's been in bands for years and years um, has realized re he realized on a project that actually he was a he was a producer and he didn't need a producer he needed an engineer and that was revelatory for him because he was like oh actually i'm producing this record i produce my own music i just need an engineer and that was like him knowing himself and then <clears throat> i think you know when it comes to whether you want to hire whether you want to hire people to help as well um it's whether it's you know what skill sets you have and, and whether you can do those yourself whether you can afford to do them you know we work with a band a brilliant band from wakefield and leeds called my my and we're the only thing out of house they do Jamie the, is a record, he's a, he owns a studio, he's a producer, so he makes their records. They do their own artwork, they do their own booking, they do their own tour management, they make their own videos, they do everything apart from their press, which we do, because they don't have that skill set in the band, and, and that works. And I think there's different, you know, the band I did, we didn't hire a PR company because I was in the band, so I did it. And, and it's like knowing, knowing your strengths as well and knowing where you are and having that kind of confidence that, you know, and and that label that label relationship as well that is a when you put your team in place around you you do not have to go to them with a finished product because part of their role as producers as A&Rs as marketing people whatever is to build on what you give them so you know again if someone says this isn't the finished product then maybe they're not a great label because then what are they doing for you as a label? They're yeah. just putting the record on streaming. Yeah. You could do that yourself. You know, there's an element of like, yeah, having the kind of faith in your vision, I suppose, without being cheesy. But um, yeah, and, and people should help. Pe the team you put in place should help you grow as an artist. The pressure should not be on you to give them something fully formed. That's what I would say. Due to consultations then. <laughs> yeah. Great. Um... Was there anyone else who had a super quick question? Um, I have a question, actually. Um, oh. <laughs> so, I mean, this is to, to anyone. Um, but if you were to go freelance today, what would you do differently from the day that you actually did go freelance? Um, set up a savings account. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, yeah. <laughs> In a nutshell. <laughs> Yeah, I, similar kind of thing. I just get on my, uh, make sure that I was on top of my to-do list much better than I was at the beginning. I kind of thought I could manage it without writing it down for quite a long time, and realise that that's a fundamental mistake. Yeah. Uh, I would, I would more clearly define my goals. I think. Yeah. I don't quite know because I've also only just started. So <laughs> it's going to write so far though, isn't it? <laughs> cool. Um, we've got a break now, haven't we? So uh, I do believe are we all dashing off or are we mingling. There's going to be a little bit of mingling, yeah, mingling, right? If anyone does have any like one on one conversations. Um, cool. Yeah, let's let's take a break. Thanks very much. Well, welcome back to Happy 3, uh, with the uh, title of the Future of Music. So, so, I was asked to keep it. 
Yeah, yeah. Uh, sure. Thais um, from London, South London, look after House Pharaoh, Sam Wise, run the management company for Click Consulting. Yeah, former lead, lead student, so. Uh, David Martin, um, I can't promise to keep it all positive. Um, I, I work at the Leaf label. Uh, we're based in Leeds. The label's been going for 26 years. It started in London originally, and then my boss moved up here. Um, launched artists such as uh, Caribou, F. De Clang. We've had a couple of Mercury nominations for Polar Bear and Comets Coming. We currently have uh, Snap Dangles and Warm Dusha on our roster. Um, before that, I was a musician. Still am a musician. A bit boring, that sort of thing. Hi, I'm Natalie Candell. I'm a freelance tour manager and event manager. And my way of responding to the pandemic was to lose all my work and apply for an arts council grant. So this year, I've um, been really lucky to have been awarded the Developing Your Creative Practice grant. And my project was all about researching and implementing um, sustainability in live music. So as part of that, I have co-founded Shift Liverpool, which is a sustainability network for the cultural sector in the Liverpool city region. And I'm also the sustainability manager at Future Yard, the brand new venue in Birkenhead. Terrific. Wonderful. OK, um, we're going to start with Brexit, because that's uh, everyone's favorite subject in music. Um, I was doing a bit of digging around and I was focused in on the parliamentary paper that came out in February this year. The Musicians Union uh, were asking for a reciprocal UK-EU agreement, which covered reciprocal work permits and visa-free touring for musicians and crew, the UK's continuing inclusion in Europe for audiovisual quotas and social security cooperation, uh, as there's often double payments. Have any of these three areas affected you and your artists and your business? And if so, how? Yeah, yeah. On live, live music. Well, so I'm a tour manager. Uh, my situation is interesting because uh, I'm Dutch and I still have an EU passport, so count myself lucky. But it, I haven't done a European tour yet. I'm dreading the day. Um, there's so many things involved like carnets and work permits and the days of, you know, does a British band want to replace a band that's dropped out at a festival in Europe with a week's notice? Those days are just gone, I think. So, yes, very much impacted my work as well as at the venue. Most bands that we've had so far at Future Yard have been British. Um, we had one American band recently and we were all like, we've never heard this accent in this place before. You know, everyone was really excited of like, hopefully that's still to come where we hear all kinds of accents within the venue. But yeah, it, it is scary and I am worried about it. And what's the consequence of that loss of spontaneity? That's kind of the magic of live music, isn't it? The spontaneity and the, you know, one band has dropped out and another band has replaced it or a lineup with bands from all over the world. It's, yeah, it, it's the magic that's going missing, I think. Um, yeah, I mean, it's a cultural exchange, isn't it? I think that Europe has become a more distant place for us, which is really uh, a sad thing. Um, so, I mean, I've got two hats on. I, I, the, live, the live music thing, as, as we've just said, like the, the carnets and, and uh, extra paperwork and the costs involved in all of that and i've been hearing like horror stories about bands that have been going out and the the customs agents don't actually know what to do with the carnets so they're they're stuck at you know at folkestone for three hours waiting in the queue with truckers and uh for their paperwork to be stamped and then they get to france and they need to get their paperwork stamped again and they don't know where to go and it's just it's adding 
hours onto onto your day and you're already you know slogging yourself I've, 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 I've toured Europe several times lots of times and you know your routing is, is often a 11 hour drive and then you, you play and then if you add another five hours onto that it just becomes totally impossible and then you know so if you you have to add in another day probably to get across borders into Schengen um, which will be costs on your crew, hire vans, hotels, just makes everything slower, more expensive. And my other hat, recorded music, is, is exactly the same thing. The, the record label I, w I work for, we, we still do a lot, heck of a lot of physical music and, and LPs in particular. And the same story there, everything is, there was, we didn't have this cliff that we dropped off which I was a little bit worried we would uh, with Brexit. Um, but the end result is that everything is, is slower and more expensive that, um, you know, our, our records, uh, the record vinyl industry was sort of creaking already and we've got lead times of six months to get your, your vinyl back, which is a long time. I've heard other, other record labels talking about nine months as well. Um, and then there are, you know, then there were unforeseen delays at the end of that. And then you've got to get your, your, your stuff from Germany or the Czech Republic, wherever it's being pressed into the UK. And then there's customs delays and charges and you can't claim your VAT back. Boring tax stuff. But, you know, trust me, I didn't get into it for tax, the record and <laughs> music. Um, and then you've got to try and get it, you know, out to, you know, America or wherever your other, uh, you know, markets are. And then there are delays in getting it out onto ships and then into customs into other other areas so you just everything is, is you know has become slower and more expensive and your um that will be borne out on you know customer prices they'll have to i'm looking at records now and i started to see things like single lps that are over 30 quid which is just ridiculous um anyway what are the other potential ramifications of this? I mean, as a label, do you make tougher decisions? Do you go for safer choices? That isn't really us. We yeah. we, um, we sort of have this uh, a niche um, where we, we we try to sort of take chances and and, and artists that that don't necessarily um, fit into any safe boxes. Um, so no, it hasn't. Not yet. Um, I don't know. It, do you know what? we'll get onto this but pandemic has meant that vinyl sales have, have, have gone through the roof people weren't spending their money on live music i'm sorry <laughs> you know it was a, it's a it's a tale of two stories in the music industry that that one side of it just dropped off a cliff and had to stop completely and that was awful and you know we, we and then the recorded industry was selling more records than than ever before but we we can't produce them quick enough and you know things like um, we'd sell out of records very quickly on release, and then we can't we can't get um, an allocation at a, a factory to do a repress. We, normally, you know, you could turn around in a month, and then you'd you know just sort of build on that success. But then it just it's gone. Once it's gone, it's you know we we I'm coming back four or five months down the line with a, a repress, and that that demand isn't there anymore. Um, yeah. Free business idea: start a plant in the UK, and you'll have many customers. Well, that is happening. That is happening, and um, and it remains to be seen. You know, we it, it absolutely needs to happen, and I've sort of thought about it myself as well. Um, but there's also it's it's a huge undertaking, and the quality control and all the rest of it that goes into making good records. It's a it's an art form as much as it is a science. So I hope I hope it's a good one. The one we're talking about Middlesbrough. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, similarly to what um, David was saying, I think there's like a general air of like uncertainty um, when it comes to touring internationally, so Europe and the rest of the world. So at the moment with, with my clients working on a UK tour and even in that sense, I think the tickets went on sale three months ago and there was a lot of flip-flopping in terms of what's gonna happen in terms of live music, COVID passports, um, all of that and when you're locked into um, a touring deal already 
it's a bit tricky to try and find your way around that and ensure that you're able to sell the amount of tickets you need to sell and people comply with that as well. Um, and I'd say, yeah, on the recorded music side, I guess on the networking front, to be able to collaborate with international artists face to face has become a lot more difficult. But I'd say I'm finding a lot more artists, big and small, from all over the world, willing to connect online and kind of just share music and yeah, whether it's Instagram, whatever, uh, Twitter, and kind of connect and say, all right, cool, I'm going to send you something over, record it on your side and send it over. So there's pitfalls and kind of opportunities there at the same time. Um, and I find that people now coming out of, well, post-pandemic, you can say, want heightened experiences. So I guess it's finding ideas and ways of my artists on how we can heighten experiences. So how do you make a live gig more than just you playing music? Is it the merch? Is it the way we set up the space? Is it the lighting? And kind of dig deeper into how we can, you know, deepen our roots and relationships with people supporting our shows. I mean, what, one of the interesting things, the visa, visa free, 19 countries are visa free. But my understanding is that the amount of time you can stay though is between seven and 180 days. It's a tour manager's job now a logistics kind of uh, management. Yes. Okay. Uh. <laughs> There's issues with how much merch you can bring in as well, um, which don't quite tie up. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it's like 1500 You can leave with £1,500 worth of merch. I don't know whether that's your cost price or what you're selling it at. I haven't figured that out. Um, but then when you get into going into Europe, it's only €1,000, so that's like 800 quid. So... You can only leave with 800 pounds worth of merch, which for an entire tour is is nothing. And that that at, you know at most levels, that's where you're actually making your money as well. Um, it's tricky, and I you know I, I just don't really want to be the first ones out out there doing it. Um, I'm hoping that, that this sort of becomes an easier route oh. that, that as we go along that that. You know that uh, I know that there are some really great uh, groups um, lobbying the government, um, carry on touring, for example, and that's vital that that we get that because Europe's a massive market on our doorstep, and and if we're not getting in that, you know, that's the future is that we need to figure out a way. And it's quite interesting that you say you, that you're you're kind of staggering if you like you're, you're letting the others <laughs> go I'm and sure, take I'm sure everyone i mean i'm sure <laughs> well, a lot exactly. are, so, so there's a kind of stagnation in the touring scene at the moment is, is that is that how you perceive it in europe for me in, ter well, in terms of the uk i wanted to be the first one out the gate as soon as stuff opened up first ones to announce that's just the approach i've taken but at the same time you take on a level of risk that okay cool you may let down your fans and not be able to do it but i rather the opportunity you know, no risk no, like no risk no reward in my eyes so yeah is it a question of just organization i mean you know you go to america you go to china you go, sorry, you go to japan yeah. established markets you, you get your act together no i know absolutely is and uh, i think that's 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 the most frustrating thing is that the you know the deals were done so late in the day uh, and then, and actually, we've had a year where we haven't been touring, so the, the negotiations could have taken place in between now and then. Um, but it's just where you get your your hard and fast information. Uh, the government aren't providing that, and it's you know, so it's it's researching and asking what people have done, and then and then there were certain grey areas about like your splitter vans, for example, um, that that carry people and and gear um there was question there were question marks for a long time about whether the, a uk registered splitter van would be legal in europe and turns out i think they are but we didn't know for ages so you know and you, you can't you, know, you can book a tour six months in advance but unless you get that information at, at a point where it's useful then I, you know that's the frustration is is you know finding finding the, the the good information that you can trust and then how it's and until, until people are out there doing it it's hard to know how any of these rules will be policed 
I mean, we, we can see how it's uh, for, the, for the major labels and acts, it's uh, fairly straightforward. There's no infrastructure to deal with it. But to representatives of the independent sector, is this a threat to your livelihood, your the future of independence in music? I, I definitely agree. Um, yeah, as we were saying, there's a lot more cost and time that has to be invested in trying to get an international tour put together that an independent might not have. Um, but I guess it's finding like interesting ways to go around it and at the same time really narrowing down where your key markets are and really focusing on those as opposed to trying to blanket everywhere. So I find taking that approach kind of cuts out a lot of the guessing when you hit a new market, for example. So yeah it's it's a difficult one promoters are providing some support but at the same time if tickets aren't selling the same way as they used to you can find yourself in a sticky one but yeah any upsides sustainability less people on the move if, if, if we really need to dig for upsides <laughs> um yeah so yeah less people on the move i guess and there's always been this thing of larger more famous bands just doing one city in each country so you would maybe only have a london show for a band that you want to see so people from all over the country are driving down to london to go see this show while well, maybe now people are it's due to covid as well tr making more elaborate uk tours which means that the fans don't have to travel as far to get to a show they want to see so i guess I see that as a little positive for a sustainability thing. And I think it's anyway really good to involve locals and independents rather than, you know, hitting all the big majors, all the major cities and all of that, like keep it more local and focus more on, you know, the sort of national music scene could be a positive thing. Maybe, how will it affect the festival scene, do you think? different lineups right, okay. i mean if you look at the lineups that we've seen over summer this year um that was mainly due to covid as well but also brexit mm -hmm. that the lineups were still really good luckily but they they are different than when you can get bands from all over the world mm -hmm. basically like you would in the past okay i'm going to move us on to covid just for extra laughs um so uh <laughs> There was an ecological economist, I always like to speak to him, uh, who had four predicted outcomes to the crisis. I wanted to see if we could resolve within this hour which of these we're going to go for. Uh, so he said uh, it's going to be the descent into barbarism, which is nice, robust state capitalism, radical state socialism, and a transformation to a big society built on mutual aid. So I just wanted to put that out there so we can come back to that at the end and we'll resolve what the future is going to be after. This is, this is, this is broader than music, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I thought we could change the world. That's what we're here for. Um, <laughs> the Arts, Arts Council commissioned a report uh, November last year into the impact of COVID on the creative industries. One of their key findings was that music was the hardest hit of all the creative industry sectors. In 2020, 70% of musicians saw the work, their work fall by at least 75%. Grassroots music venues and arenas lost an average 75% of income. Technical co companies lost an average 95% of income. Why was music specifically hit so hard? And how did the sector make moves to help itself? Uh. I mean, again, it was the, the, the music sector was, well, I think, was split into two into that live and recorded music. And um, and there is a camaraderie between those two. We, rec you know, as a, as a record label, we recognize that we can't exist without the live you know, arm of music. And there's that, that sort of community that grows up in venues like this or, you know, Brudenell or yeah, all, all around country um that that's where people hear live music and and so you know there were i think there, there was a sort of banding together and a community spirit that that we can't let venues go under there were you know a lot of um 
moves to to protect to protect local grassroots venues um and that was great and that was uh, you know really pleasing to see um i have no idea where i'm going with this where, where, what was the what was the question <laughs> sorry it's me it's my own coffee um why music hit how, music how did music was, help itself all the creative industries are all have different effects of covid why was that industry hit so hard just because people couldn't couldn't get together there's you know there's a huge amount of money in in live music and that's where artists are making their money more so now than record sales um so you go to the core of core of this and you know their their pie keeps getting divvied down through dsps through record you know historical record deals and all the rest of it and um but they're the people that you can't this industry can't exist without the other people are there to facilitate um I, somewhere along the line that got forgotten about but but maybe we need to get back to that idea um yeah yeah i guess um in the past before the internet um bands did tours so they could promote their record and sell more records yeah. and the tour was an expense for that but now it's almost like let's bring out a record so we can do another tour and make money by ticket sales and especially selling merchandise as well. And there are some artists who've been really creative over um, the lockdowns of doing live streams and still managing to sell merchandise while doing that and things like that. But yeah, it's been really hard. Um, whenever someone says like music has been hit the hardest, I sometimes think, do I only think that because I work in that industry and am I not thinking of all these other poor industries, which there are plenty. Um, but yes, definitely. Um, I'm not saying it's a, a good thing that happens at all, but I do think that the pandemic has given lots of music organizations some breathing space to rethink their business model and to rethink what they are doing. And so many, many organizations and artists and record labels and whatnot have been looking into sustainability and how to involve more environmental practice and what they're doing. And they've kind of been given, like forced to have this time to work on that. So that's kind of a little positive note from me. You're quite good at the positives. I was trying to think of those and I didn't really get to any. Anything to add? Um, I guess another positive I'd say is going back to like what I was saying in terms of high end experiences. I think um, the upside for me in terms of when we was in lockdown was thinking about the amount of demand that is creating at the moment. So, well, at the time, should I say. So, yeah, for me, it was just a moment to kind of rethink um, rollout in terms of how I'm actually rolling out campaigns with my artists and how that leads up to a tour and how we can make it more engaging so then we're cutting through the noise of other artists and whatever whispers of uncertainty that are in the air. So for me, yeah, I was just thinking about how many people are going to be dying to get to a gig and how can I find them and how can they essentially find us? So, yeah. We sort of just touched on very briefly about live streaming, and we'll, we'll talk about that in more detail shortly. But in terms of um, online concerts, there was, it was trialed, and for some, Nick Cave, way, very, very successful. Um, is, there, is there potential in the future for online concerts? I'm not keen on them, no. The, there's nothing that compares to a live gig, seeing your favorite artist live in the flesh. Um, so I don't necessarily see that happening. Um, maybe in other forms, like I enjoyed seeing what Travis Scott done with Fortnite and something in that realm where it's like there is a fan base and a user base that can tap into that and are already fans of his stuff and kind of being able to sell even his merch on that platform um and opening up the conversations cryptocurrencies as i was saying before um and just yeah how that's going to change the landscape for like monetizing your art at the end of the day mm -hmm. so yeah mm -hmm. i mean i would yeah I, I i wouldn't discount it i think that there are will be fans in in parts of the world that you will probably never get to even with the best will in the world um so yeah, you know, I think it, I think it opens up a, another 
potential avenue. It's not it's not for everyone, um, but if you do it do it smart. None of this, you know. You need to spend some money on the production, and then you know you need to to sort of figure out how how that weighs against the potential, um, uh, you know, press or. Um, well, either you sort of sell tickets or you're doing it for a promotional um, thing. And then, you know, you said, as with anything, you just sort of have to weigh up those costs. Um, I don't know. I, I, on the fence, really. I think if done well, it can be really valuable. And here's another free business idea that I've had uh, in my sustainability journey. So when I talked about people traveling from really far to get to gigs and you saying there are parts of the world where you may never play, what if you put on a real gig, say in London in a big venue, get a really good camera crew and exactly at the time that gig is going on, you live stream that to like cinemas all over the world where people can see it on a really good screen with a really good sound system and have that gig experience without having to fly into a city to see that. I think that would be really amazing and that could maybe now we've had all these different live streams that could be something that might be of interest in the future. I think, I think it would be great and but I also think that to do it you have to be at a certain level um, to, to get that level of production right that, that you can sort of feel that live experience through yeah. Yeah definitely but with live streams in general I've seen some live streams that have really worked with the medium because it, when you do a live stream you can do things that you can't do on the stage as well and you can like cut in little videos and everything like that and i've seen bands with low budget who've done really cool things like a band i work with called planet booty and they are as fun as the name sounds but so they did you know little videos that they've put in during the live stream while they also played live and then there's someone like Mark Rabier who does it from his living room. And it's very, it's very sort of DIY. He's the only person in that room doing it, but still makes it really fun and special by interacting with the audience and things like that. So if done well, live streams can definitely work. But I think a lot of people during the pandemic were just like, let's put the webcam on and see if I can make some money. And it was a bit awkward and DIY sometimes. Yeah. So basically yeah. Sorry. yeah, in a way, it can be done on an independent level. Um, we have done a live stream show um, at Tower Bridge outside City Hall, The Scoop. We've done a show there with House of Pharaohs, and that was a free show. Live streamed it on YouTube, not quite a cinema, but everyone in the world can technically see it. And that went down really well with pretty small budget, just a laptop and a camera, really, to make it happen, and a mixing desk to plug the audio into. So it can be done. Um, and once you do step into the realms of wanting to do stuff, um, like in terms of motion on the camera and stuff like that, then you can really heighten the experience for sure. Mm -hmm. So it's doable, it's doable. Um, I wanted to look at some of the uh, government initiatives and see how they did or didn't impact the music industry. Uh, so we, you know, we had a few sort of positive initiatives, obviously the job retention scheme, furloughing, uh, we had the self-employed income support scheme, 1.87 billion culture uh, culture recovery fund, uh, and business rate relief, uh, which went on, I think, when that relief wasn't in until 31st of March. So we've had all these issues which have now, one by one, kind of come to a, come to an end. But there was only 34% take up of furlough by the arts and cultural sector. What was the what, why? Why? Clearly, it's one of the most independent, self-regulated, self-employed. What was the worry? Um, um, we, I mean, I, 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 these are creative people. Um, I don't think you, you, you turn off your creativity like a tap. Um, you just find new ways to work. And that was one of the reasons why I wasn't necessarily concerned about, you know, you, saying that the music industry was one of the hardest hits hit uh, during the pandemic. And I, I, I wasn't overly concerned about it sort of bouncing back and finding new ways to exist uh, during the pandemic, be simply because it's creative people with a drive uh, that, that, that want to make music 
and and everything that goes around with that. So I think maybe furlough didn't happen a, a great deal because we were, you know, I speak for myself, but I was, we were working from home and we were just making things happen in a slightly different way. Mm -hmm. um, you know, um, yeah. The Cultural Recovery Fund, very small uptake uh, for the music sector. Any reasons for that? I think when just do you know what rock and roll just isn't used to, to taking money from the government. It Literally. feels like it's stuff, well, you know. That, they might ask for it back. <laughs> yeah, it feels like it's stuff that was for 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 orchestras and you know it, it it's it's never it's never come naturally to us. We're kicking against, we kick against the government at a possible opportunity. Um, and I guess it's the information as well. Whether yeah. you know whoever was privy to that would have taken. The opportunity i guess so there is a level of that in terms of like yeah self-employed artists who are consumed in their music and still recording at home or at a mate studio or studio that they're comfortable going to so it's, you're not necessarily thinking about what's the government going to do for me more what am i going to do for myself so yeah i definitely think that lots of music organizations or self-employed people didn't think any of the funding applied to them and the same with the fund that I applied for, Develop Your Creative Practice, which was originally for artists of any type of discipline. And someone posted in a touring Facebook group, I think, saying, oh, in the small print, it says they've now sort of elaborated it to, you know, arts practitioners, including sound engineers or lighting designers. So it didn't say tour managers, but I thought... I'll give it a try and I'll put in my motivation why I think I fall under the bracket. And it, when I submitted it, I did think, I don't know if this applies to me. They might see it and think, what are you doing here? Um, but then when I got it, I did put out on a few groups saying, just so everyone knows, I was eligible. You should all try it too. And I got multiple people asking me for some advice and some of them were successful afterwards as well. So it is a lack of information as well, often thinking that it doesn't apply yeah. to us. We do, we did take up loans and, and, and stuff as well. Um, but yeah, it's just about being switched on and, and the, the people that you're talking to. And that's, that doesn't necessarily reach to, to all, all corners, unfortunately. Um, I don't know. That's... Yes, some of the research came back that's saying that, you know, this sector is just not used to asking for public sector funding you know it's 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 just not the way it, um and then having to go through the old you know the detail of a, a, f a funding form and have to justify everyone's working position and legitimacy it's not um, fun it's not rock not rock and roll it's, it's not rock and roll no yeah. um <laughs> is does this now being i don't know does this now bring us on to kind of thinking about how the music industry needs to help itself. I mean, we talked about kind of local cooperation, but is there something more, you know, if, if the government isn't the source of recovery and isn't a natural bedfellow for music, is there something that needs to be more self-organized? I mean, music is very well organized in terms of petitioning, uh, but is it more, is it well organized in terms of keeping each other alive, keeping each other as an industry working from the bottom up? I think, It is on a ground level, but I feel from the top down in terms of artists being paid enough for their money to be able to survive any kind of situation, that's what needs changing. So, yeah, I find it difficult to expect artists to be surviving in a pandemic if they have a lack of information and at the same time are being undervalued in terms of what they're being paid by DSPs. So. Okay. Um, trying to think of some positives of COVID. Um, you know, the, there is a precedent, if you look at the whole of cultural history, that great times of adversity, we, we know the cliche. Yeah, so, you know, bubonic plague, 50 million died, but... Some great records came out. We had out the Renaissance. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so what, what is the musical legacy of COVID? What, what's coming out that, you know, people went back to the bedroom, started making stuff again, in more sort of domestic production experimentation. Are we seeing any results from this? 
Um, I, I mean, I, I think we will continue to see the results. And, uh, you know, whether it's the pandemic or Brexit or both, and it's, you know, the governmental response to the pandemic. And, and I think there's a lot to be angry about. And I think that anger is a really great energy to put into to records and, and, and stuff that sort of tackles that head on in a, in a creative way. Um, anyway, I, I, I'm, I'm here for it and I'm sure there's a massive market for it. Um, and you know, it's, it's all, there's always great music happening and, and, uh, you know, I just hope, hope, yeah, I, th I think, and, um, the next sort of few years will, will bear this out. I think that there's some, you know, really great artistic responses to that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So anything that you've come across? you can highlight as being a trend that's come from that time in the music i would it's too, it's too soon yeah i think for the music it's a little bit soon but i'm not sure i think in terms of what surrounds the music is what we're seeing more i think more interesting campaigns that can engage you from home is what i'm starting to see in music um, particularly in hip-hop um if you know of a guy called millions he done a thing called uh, provisional license is the name of his project and um, around that he's like done content with like um celebrities around it and um, started like a game show online and stuff like that so i think you're gonna see yeah just more interesting campaigns to be able to gravitate towards as opposed to just putting the music out and having it there i think people know now there's more that's required to cut through and actually penetrate so yeah that's interesting I think um, I'm giving a really mainstream example, high level, um, but artists have this sort of album cycle with like releasing an album, doing tours around the world, and um, like they only release albums every two or three years because they have to work through this whole process. But so for example, Taylor Swift had just released her Lover album and was supposed to do this massive world tour, which got canceled. So instead she wrote another two albums that she released in like six months time, which was very unusual for an artist like that. And there are a few other artists who've done things like that, who were just forced to, you know, be home instead of be on tour and then looked at other things that they were doing and created things that they otherwise wouldn't have created, which I think was really interesting outcome from that. Okay, well, this, this takes us into streaming very nicely, so thank you for that. Um, so, another parliamentary paper, but it is worth looking at them. Um, July of this year, a parliamentary paper on music streaming to DCMS. Uh, artist remuneration addressed the disparity in power between creatives, creators sorry, and companies. Is there a disparity and why? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think a lot of it is based on historical record deals. Um, a lot of, you know, that they, they set the template and, and major record labels have a lot to answer for. They hold stakes in Spotify. Um, so they're getting money through the back door whilst their artists are getting the paltry royalty rate. Um, <laughs> It was a chance, and I guess this, you know, it's, it's still being talked about, but the whole digital music revolution was a chance to sort of tear all of that down. And, and it was just sort of rebuilt in, in sort of in the same model as, as previously, unfortunately. Um, I mean, I didn't really get a chance to talk about what the, you know, when you were talking about um, Brexit and how that affects sort of indies and, and majors and, um, I think that the gap there will just get larger because these these big rec recording companies have the resources to you know have specialists to sort out all of their tax implications and they'll, they'll you know they'll have companies little companies set up in all of these territories and claiming their VAT back and all the rest. We've got four people and that's you know and that's the creative team and and we're trying to sort out our taxes and all the rest of it. So they're going to be making hay whilst we're trundling through all this crap. Um, and it's the same. And um, I don't know what the answer is, but I know, you know, I'm, I'm certainly following it with interest. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm 
just the grumpy old guy that complains about everything here, but um, this is where we're at. <laughs> I mean, I guess just to add some stats to that, just because I'm, I'm a bit boring that way. Um, Universal, Sony, Warner, combined value now $100 billion uh, from streaming, which is, is just extraordinary. Uh, what, how does these, that, are these are multinational. These are multinational companies, <laughs> so that money's just going and probably sitting offshore somewhere. So, you know, Brexit was a great opportunity, apparently, to to you know to remodel again. Um, but they've just handed the power to multinationals, um, whilst the independents that were working our asses off currently still are. It was, you know, it wasn't a cliff. It's just everything got slightly worse. And more expensive, more difficult, and that's just sort of skimming, skimming the money that was going to the artists or the creatives uh, a little bit more. Oh, yeah, you know, I'm angry. Clearly, yeah, good. rightly so. <laughs> um, is the question whether there is a disparity between? Yeah, yeah, there's this disparity between you know what what are the reasons behind this and why is it being, you know streaming isn't a new thing. Yeah, it, it's been talked about a lot. There's yeah, been yeah. lots of parliamentary papers. Why are we still having the conversation? I suppose. Yeah, I think you put it pretty clearly that the the key stakeholders are still the major labels. So the structure behind it is still going to be quite archaic in the way that you know it's them first and the creators last. Oh. So so long as they're essentially in power or have a voice within that world, it's going to be difficult um, for artists, particularly independents, to be able to see enough money from um, streaming. But I feel, you know, at the same time, it's the nature of the way things are in a sense, because obviously the majors hold massive catalogue. Um, and if they say they don't want that catalogue on those streaming platforms, then you know, it shoots us in the foot either way because then there won't be enough users on the platform to listen to independent artists. So it's a bit of a catch-22 in a way. Um, but I feel it just needs to be reevaluated in the way that, you know, money is moving around those companies and between your Spotify's and who their stakeholders are and the independents that are, you know, utilizing the platform as well. But I feel things could change with, like, independent artists maybe wanting to distribute their music in different forms and fashions, maybe going towards physical and stuff like that. But it's a tough ask. It's a tough ask. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a tough time. It's a time when I think the multinationals have clearly exploited uh, the vulnerability of, of the economy and the music industry. Live Nation hoovered up all the small the festivals. Disaster capitalism. Um, yeah. And, you know, it's not just music, no. that, but yeah. Yeah, yes. I mean, I, but there's, you know, we report another report. September, so just last month, uh, top 1% of artists account for 80% of all streams, 10% account for 98% of all streams. The mainstream is winning, folks. What are we going to do? What can be done? <laughs> um, I. I that's that's the frustrating thing is I, I just I don't I don't know um, I think awareness transparency all of that stuff when you enter into a, a you know let's say you know a major record label comes knocking then have a think about this stuff and I'm not saying I'm not you know I'm not going to be all I'm not going to say don't but just have a think and uh, be aware of, of how that money that pie is getting sliced um go into it with open eyes um and you know music groups will continue to lobby as 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 they have done over the last few years and you know beyond that um i don't know change will be slow i suspect okay so gone to a positive go on i'm trying i'm trying <laughs> <laughs> it's like being a comedian um, it's made releasing music so much simpler. Um, it was there's another report saying that in 2020, 65,000 new songs were uploaded each day. There are pros and cons to that, aren't yeah. there? <laughs> Big time. There's a lot of there's a lot of noise there. Yeah. So how do we filter through it? How does you know? Is 
you know, how do we manage content? How do we curate content production in a way that makes sense for development of music rather than saturation? I think you, I mean, I've, I've always said that it's about story, you know, telling stories and putting your music into context. And that goes for, you know, um, just making a name for yourself on a local live scene, you know, to have a think about how you're presenting, um, you know, what you're telling people, what you're not telling people. You don't have to, you don't have to give them everything. Um, you know, you don't, no one wants to read a three page bio about how you met at, at, you know, at university or whatever. Do some myth making as well. Um, you know, tell a tell a story and and make it stick, and that's 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 always been the case, you know, historically. I think. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think. You know, what was it sixty five thousand songs a day? <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> that is a lot of music to cut through. Um, as I was saying, it's finding interesting ways to engage your fan base. Um, and that comes from telling a story and finding touch points within your story or come from my perspective, my client's story um, and certain things that I know about him um, or the collective that will translate into the people or listeners that we want. Um, and at the same time, being proactive and looking at your streaming data as much as you can and understanding what it means for, you know, how many tickets you can sell or where you should be marketing your next album, whether it's a particular city or town in a remote place that is all of a sudden listening to your music, that's when you should be adding fuel to the fire. I was, I was looking at a thing called the Trigger Cities. Yeah. Where you sort of like sort of Jakarta and Mexico City and these places that have huge streaming numbers and, and they are relatively cheap to market to. So you can, you can wind your streams up quite, quite big time with, with, with very little money. I don't, I don't know if that translates to a sort of an international, you know, but potential to go out there and tour, maybe somewhere along the line, but interesting. I mean, it has, you know, one of the upsides clearly is the global audience that has now become a, we're not, we're not talking about world music as something exclusive to, to the, um, but it's also kind of let through things like K-pop. Uh, which, like it or not, you know, is, is the most dominant force in the music industry at the, at the moment. You know, it's, uh, but what, how does that then let, leave something like English music, British music? Is it seen as nostalgic still? Is it seen as something of the past? How are we moving forward? How are you moving forward? I don't know what what British music means. It's, it, you know, the exciting thing is that it's it's a whole load of different things to different people and a whole load of cultures, and that's was you know always exciting and should be celebrated um no i mean it 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 just gives us the chance to 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 sell abroad in the in the in the same way it's always it's it's always been it's all you know it's always been good i think the frustrating thing is that the market that's next door to us has just been sort of the do door has been not closed but just sort of it's it's probably closed but not locked yeah. um but that's that's the most frustrating thing. Um, but you know, yeah, streaming streaming's open 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 the door. To, yeah, to I think there markets. is a clearer roadmap in terms of um, live touring that streaming has opened up to me in the sense that yeah, just following the numbers and seeing that okay, cool, there is a fan base growing out in that city in whichever region and seeking to just grow that bit by bit and find out how you can, though you're in Leeds and you have a fan base in London, whatever it may be, how can you engage with those fans um, virtually, even at this point? So, yeah, I think the information that you can get back is a lot more useful than you think. I think, as we're saying, you know, particularly in UK rap and hip hop, like the market of Europe's always been there, but I think people have lacked the information on where, when and how to attack it. So I think that's kind of open now. Um, to allow, you know, artists, uh, obviously at the biggest level, Skepta, be able to cross over and make waves in other continents. So, yeah. Interesting. How are we doing for time? Sorry, I didn't... Oh. Very helpfully didn't bring that. <laughs> okay. Oh, all right, okay. Uh, well, let's just whiz right <laughs> on to the last day. I mean, uh, you know, the future of music, how do we look at it? But let's look at some of the kind of 
political and social issues. Um, yesterday, there was the release, release of the Black Lives in Music survey, um, which uh, was one of the biggest surveys ever done in terms of the experience of, of people of colour in music industry. So here's some hideous findings. Um, conclusive evidence, systematic racism exists in the UK music industry. 86% of black music creators agree that there are barriers to progression. 86%. The number rises to 89 for black women and 91% for black cre creators who are disabled. Three in five, 63% black music creators have experienced direct or indirect racism in the industry. And more than 71% racial microaggravations. Why are we still at this stage? What can be done? Why, why this is like reading something from 1974. I mean, what are your thoughts? I, I, I mean, I'm, I'm, it's, awful, it's awful to hear and, um, and that these are important conversations that, that have been, that we should have been having for a long time, but actually feels like maybe they're on the table now and we're actually having them. And it's, you know, access to, um, you know, I guess tr traditionally a lot of music came out of affluent, you know, sort of through affluent people and they were the gatekeepers and they would sort of uh, open the door to their, their friends. And um, we need to make sure that, you know, when there's funding, uh, funding, from the government for the arts, that means it's open to everyone and it's represent, you know, and everyone is being represented within that. But, but this is more beyond that, isn't it? It's about sort of the institutions in which music is created and produced and disseminated. They are fundamentally racist. It, I'm, I, I'm disgusted by that. I'm... But are you surprised? No. Right. Interesting, isn't it? I was well, surprised. Well, you know. 86 percent me out no it is it's, it's, it's I don't know I, I you know I'm I'm not surprised it's also not just the music industry it's everywhere so I guess that's also why I'm not surprised yeah I wouldn't say I'm surprised um and I think it it's important to take heed that it's actual experiences people are experiencing that make up these statistics if you go know I mean um, I wouldn't say I've experienced a great deal of it myself, I say, but I'd say there are certain aspects of the music industry that are made a little bit more difficult, if you get what I mean. So, for example, touring um, at Electric Brixton, where we're doing on the 27th of October with Samwise, we get charged extra security just because it's a high risk event. But then 75% of our fan base is white, if you get what I mean. So, it's an interesting one. I don't. I don't know. It's it. It takes shape in those forms, and I would say for me, it's, it hurts both financially and you know as being a person, a black person. If you know what I mean, so yeah. Should there be more government intervention? Is that one of the answers? I mean, if, well, that you know, as we as we were saying, that there was fun. There was funding available, and it wasn't taken up by 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 a large proportion and I suspect a lot of that was 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 from these communities but that's that's the messaging that we're that, that the government is sending out and continues to and the and rhetoric and all of the rest of it that's gone with brexit and the current lot that are in that are in government sadly it's right it's right you know it's right at the top and it's all it's all the way through and yeah I mean there's been some positive campaigning uh, particularly more on gender, but, you know, the, the PRS have said that 50-50 of their board will become um, white, black, male, female, etc. You know, does it need to be more positive action to actually just make some practical shifts so that the institution of the boys' club uh, is sort of whittled down one by one? Yeah, representation. Yeah, yeah representation for, you know, all minorities is definitely important and just diversity in 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 all ways um and this is again with looking to your local community as well um just involve all the people that you know live around your organization whoever they are and give them opportunities that's something you've been involved in um yeah so 
Um, at Future Yacht, the venue, we are very involved in the community. And so one example is we've got a program to get young people to come work in the music industry. So young people between 16 and 24, they um, can join our program, which is free to them, which they get hands-on experience with the technicians and event managers in the venue. And with that as well, we want people who are local and we very much look at diversity and gender equality as well in that. I think we've run out of time, haven't we? Sorry. Just... Where's the stage manager? <laughs> Are we out of time? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Let, let's just throw it open for questions then. Yeah. I'd love to know what people are thinking right now. <laughs> we've covered a lot of ground. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, I wasn't. I was just saying this isn't really a question as much as a response to what's been said. Um, I mean, I feel like as as the artist, as as the venues, like smaller venues, there is so much potential to kind of um, create ev events that are not necessarily that expensive that give a platform to many people at once. Scratch nights, you know, cabaret style things maybe just take a chance on on people just to kind of outreach rather than asking but this is not directed at anyone in particular but again like i'm angry i'm upset on behalf of people who just feel like they're locked out and really we just have to realize that we have um leverage and we have power because the art at the end of the day is what people want to buy and what people want to see and if you give it all away for free online, um, it's going to get eaten up by these monopolies. And we just have to kind of um, keep keep a bit back that's exclusive for the people that are actually turning up to the venues and the people that are actually supporting each other. So if you want to see this, come and support it. And then it will shift back the other way. But we're just obsessed about streams and online and stuff. And I, I just, even Facebook Live, I can't use that because I don't want Google Chrome because I hate Google. And it's it's kind of like it locks you out if you've got principles. Um, and it shouldn't be the case because we actually have a lot of opportunity to, to share this stuff and to just say fuck it to the industry. It's, it's, it's increasingly difficult to have a moral compass in all of this. You've got to get into bed with some shit people. Um, or you don't, but then you have to accept I mean, I don't know. I, yeah, I, I completely feel what, where you're coming from. And um, I'm not going to judge anyone on, you know, on what what um, what browser they use or, uh, or services, but, um, but you've got to pick and choose where, where your line is. And that's, you know, everyone, not just music. <laughs> Hey, right. Um, my question is um, just to do with the whole like London thing and stuff. Like, do you think like living in Leeds and like you know creating a buzz around here and stuff, there's as much opportunity, or would it be like better or worse in comparison to like um, like you know being around London? Like, how does like Leeds? Do you think you can make it just in Leeds, or do you think you sort of have to move to like London to like you know get in with like the big people and the people at the top sort of thing? Would you move? Um, no, I wouldn't move. But I wouldn't move from London. But I don't think you can just make it in either place. If you get what I mean. Um, as I said, you can't have to be everywhere. But you can start a fan base or some sort of following or traction from your hometown. I feel, yeah, people understand quality music at the end of the day. Not everyone will ad adapt to it and adopt to it straight away. But I think you can start something. So. I think there's a lot less noise in Leeds. Um, so that for me is a bit of an opportunity. And yeah, going down to London, it's like having to completely readapt to a new space and doing all of that stuff where I feel there is people who are willing to take on new music here. Um, and it's just 
yeah, making sure that you're pushing it correctly so that people are like have access to it at the end of the day. Um, and you're wanting to grow beyond your immediate fan base. Um, this is a question I've heard a lot over the years. Um, and I think my answer to that's probably the same. I think Leeds is well, well enough set up with enough venues, enough, enough stuff happening that you can, you can make things happen here and you can, um, you know, you can build a fan base up, but, but the thing that, that it has in its favor is you can make mistakes here as well. You can, you can learn your craft. You know, if that's if that's live live music, you can you know you can have a, you can have a crap gig, and then you can learn to, to have a better gig next time, and then an even better one next time. If you go down to London and maybe you've got a bit of buzz about you because you know something's blown up on online, you'll have representatives of all those big record labels come in to see you, and you and if it's and if the stage show isn't ready. You're, you're written off. Um, you know, you have to start again. You have to build it all back up. You know, maybe change change your stage name or whatever. Write new songs. I think Leeds sort of has this sort of environment and a community that that supports it. Uh, that 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 when the time is right, people will start paying attention in London if that's if that's what it is. Or you know. Yeah, and it really depends what kind of artist you want. There's a question I ask all the artists and producers that I manage: What kind of artist do you want to be? That's like the number one question. And a lot of the time it's like you want to, like a lot of artists want to be global and international. So you have to think that way in a way as well, if you get what I mean. And that's far beyond London, if you get what I mean. So yeah, with the tools that you're given online now, like you can be sat in your bedroom in Leeds and market directly to somebody and wherever in the world, so long as they're on Facebook, Instagram or anything else. So. It's, I mean, it's cheaper to live up here as well. <laughs> yeah, literally. So, yeah, I think there's an opportunity to create something, something cool up here. So it's just finding the gaps and what is everybody else doing and how can I look different to that so I, I stand out here and, again, use the opportunity to make your mistakes and be ready for when you hit a bigger market. Okay. Any final yeah, questions? I've, I've got a question. This is for Gaius. Um, I've got two questions, actually. Um do you think that the ecosystem of music distribution um, channels such as Linkup TV, um, GRM Daily, SBTV, do you think that those um, channels are good for um, for building building yourself up as a producer, not a rapper? Um, and the second question is, um, going off what you said about um, international, um, getting known internationally, do you really think that UK artists um really need to be chasing that american bag or do you think that there's enough here in the uk for them to be satisfied um so your first question was what was your first question again sorry the first question, tv and as a producer as a producer do you think that the ecosystem that we have here as in link up tv yeah sbtv grm daily is it a good ecosystem to come up in as a producer not a rapper it's that same question. What kind of producer do you want to be? Yeah. That's what I, I, I manage a producer now recently called D Sharp. And I asked him, what kind of producer do you want to be? And you can choose to work with artists that are on that platform. I see you got a No Days Off hat, so you know Nux. Oh, yeah, you he know releases, this one, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He releases on his own platform. So it's like there is opportunity there. So at the end of the day, you have to ask yourself what kind of artist you want to be. And that will in turn like inform your decisions onto whether you use those platforms whether you don't or whether you find yourself somewhere in between and then your second question was yeah do you do you really think that uk artists need to be chasing that american bag or do you think that there's enough in the uk for them to be satisfied i personally don't think there is enough in the uk to be satisfied mm -hmm. um and I don't say that to say that, you know, America's where it's at, because my focus in terms of House of Pharaohs is very much mm -hmm. like Eurocentric and I'm trying to focus on penetrating European markets because I know they have a history of, you know, supporting hip hop groups and collectives in general. So I don't necessarily think that America is, you know, the be all and end all. I think it makes sense for certain artists and I think it doesn't make sense for certain artists. I have an artist, whose sound is a bit more Afrocentric. So 
I'm going to push his sound in Africa a bit more than I do anywhere else. So it's about the sound and where it can connect. And then going on from there, I think that's when you then put yourself in a position to choose whether I'm going to conquer this next territory or develop this one that I'm in or focus on a particular city, if you know what I mean. So I don't think America is the be all and end all. Nice one. Thank you so much. Uh, really, I'm sorry, lots of lots of questions. I don't know where to go with this, but um, the future's interesting. I think that's the, uh, the the conclusion I can come from. It's diverse, it's interesting, and and it's to be to be claimed. So, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you guys. Um, and we're back with the final the keynote uh, in conversation with Nick Hodgson in about ten minutes. Thank you. Hello. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Hello, hello, Leeds. Are you ready to hear about the music industry? Yeah, I can't hear you. The music industry. Yeah. Yes. Well, I'm buzzing. I'm buzzing because we've got a very special, highly talented, multi-skilled musician with us in the room today. Uh, he'll be here in just a moment. It's Nick Hodgson. P.S. It's Nick Hodgson. Uh, a little something about who I am. Uh, my name is Cathy Booth, and I'm a journalist and a reporter at BBC Look North. Uh, my specialism is music. Um, that's what I get excited about. So I've covered loads and loads of festivals, Leeds Festival, Tramlines, Live at Leeds. And I've interviewed a lot of bands and artists as well. Um, recently, Youngblood, Jake Bug, Stereophonics, Jarvis Cocker, amazing life uh, highlight that was. And the Kaiser Chiefs as well, uh, among my days. So in addition to all of that stuff, I think the reason that I've been chosen to do this particular interview is that I'm of a certain vintage back in the early noughties um, when the music scene in Leeds was extremely exciting. I was going out dancing every week at various nightclubs like Pigs at the Hi-Fi Club and the Village Green Preservation Society at Milo's. Anybody remember those? The session at the cockpit? Come on, someone's been to the session. Hey, yes, good. Is that Tom Goodhand? No, somebody else. Anyway, it was an exciting time and there was a young DJ there at that time playing records by the likes of the Ravenettes and Hot Hot Heat. And uh, he was also a drummer in a band. And there before our eyes, this young DJ, this young drummer, his band became very famous indeed. And they stopped playing our little club nights and started headlining festivals and playing absolutely massive gigs. And of course, they were the Kaiser Chiefs. And they went on to become one of the biggest bands of the noughties. So that was Nick Hodgson was the DJ. And the Kaiser Chiefs were the band and it was one hell of a time. So to tell us more about that time and what's happened since, will you please give a huge welcome to Nick Hodgson. <laughs> That was Parkinson. Hi. Hi. You have that one. Is it? Hi. Yeah. Am I sitting on this set? Yeah. Okay. Oh. Hello, everyone. Good start. What an introduction. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. So, we've started talking about that time, 2003, 2004. Take me back to that okay. time. You were DJing, you were in an early version of the Kaiser Chiefs. Take um, us back. Yeah, actually, we were Parva when I first started doing Pigs with Ricky. We were Parva, so it's, let me think, 2001, and, uh, oh yeah, I was DJing at the cockpit, um, and I was doing all that, I was in the little room at the cockpit, I was supposed to do new music, only new music, and then it kind of morphed into, actually it was quite good because there was a lot of new music coming out, like, so, do you remember like the Detroit scene? Yes. It was like 2001, there was this compilation called Sympathy for the Record, Recording Industry, and it had all these bands on, like, the White Stripes, the Green Horns, and I don't know who else, Electric Six, all these bands, and it oh, was yeah, all this Soul garage Dad rock. Brothers. Remember them? The, yeah, Soul yeah. Brothers. We was... all had mullets, didn't we? We all like I wore didn't. trucker caps. I didn't have a mullet. We all wanted to be American, or I did. Yeah, no, a lot of people, <laughs> yeah. So that was a big scene, and that kind of just sort of started at the time I was starting to DJ, which is really, really cool. And the Strokes, obviously. Of course. The Strokes. And then it was the hives and all these bands, all this garage rock stuff. And then we 
decide it's our own night because of all this music. I often think, would I be able to do the same thing now? Start a whole night based on some, all only new music. And I don't know if I could, but right then we were very lucky. We had this amazing time. It was like only five, six years after like Oasis and Britpop and stuff, maybe seven years after. And so um, obviously the Strokes came along and just changed everything. And so they, um, we decided to start this night and it was called Pigs. It was so good. It was so it was good. good. It was the last Tuesday of every month. And I was saying to Nick before we came out, like, when I first went there, I, I felt like, you know, it, it was my people. Like, I can get on yeah. here. And, and it, it was a club night that changed lives. I yeah, think. and we didn't play any Oasis. We didn't play any Stone Roses. <laughs> we didn't play the Smiths even. And I love the Smiths. Well, yeah. I love all those bands. But it was really important not to play anything like that. We didn't, I, mean, I think we maybe played like Pulp. Mm. Um, but we played just all this new stuff. And then I used to throw in like strange things like, well, not, they weren't strange, but like Michael Jackson and, because mm. it was also, there was a club night in, in London called Trash, oh, which yeah. I never went to, but the whole concept was, um, oh, also Electro Clash had just come out as well. Do you, anyone know Electro Clash? Look it up, kids. <laughs> <laughs> it's a quality genre. But if you did have a tattoo that said, I love Electro Clash, it will definitely be out of date now. Yeah. So, Obviously, you were in the band at that time as well. Oh, yeah, we were Parva. So we were trying at that point to be garage rock. So our set consisted of like a whole load of genres in one sort of 30 minute set. It wasn't working. <laughs> it was a bit of a mishmash. We had some good bits, but we didn't have any good songs. Well, we, did, we, we didn't really have good songs, but we had a lot of other things that were good. Yeah, it was the start of something, wasn't it? Yeah. There were a lot of bands around at that time. Are there any sort of Leeds bands that never got the critical acclaim that you feel they should have yeah, got? Yeah, we used to love this band, Sammy USA. Mm. And um, they got signed. They were called Jewels. They got yeah. signed to Nude, I think. No, they got signed to Ireland, actually, when they were Sammy USA. Uh, and I don't think the album came out, but they were dead good. Yeah. They were our favourite. But it worked for you. You were the, the, the band... Of that time. It's probably because of that, actually. It. To be fair, it was because of that, because they got signed to Ireland and we were just like, yeah. <laughs> what about us? How did it happen? What happened? Talk, talk me through that time. Okay. And when did you realize, like, holy cow, we're going to make it? Well, it was a lot to do with pigs. So uh, we'd, we'd read this, I'd read this thing that there was various bands that were doing club nights as well, like in London and stuff. And I thought, okay, we're going to do that. That's what we're going to do. And that really informed all the DJing and the club nights really informed how our music went. It got more like popular because you could tell, I could tell on it. We used to rehearse on a Saturday morning as well as other times during the week. But on the Saturday morning, I'd come, I'd been DJing on the Friday night at the cockpit and I'd come into the rehearsal on the Saturday morning and it'd be like, okay, I know which beats, I know which drum beats are working. I know what the kids like now. <laughs> Cause I thought I was old then. I was like 20, Five, 24, 25. Mm. And so the kids were like 17 year olds, 18 year olds. And I was looking at them and thinking, okay, they really react to this, this, and this. Basically, Blondie. If I ever put a Blondie record on, everyone would dance. So, so we and just copied the Blondie beats and just added music on top. <laughs> were there any particular individuals who were key in helping get the Kaiser Chiefs into yeah, the mainstream? Yeah. Okay, so um, I digress. Um, there was a guy called Tim Jones who wrote for The Enemy. Is that where you were going with? I remember Tim Jones okay. had your back, and I remember thinking, how did they get that? Yeah, so he, we invited him to DJ at a club night for some reason. I don't know how, but I did invite him. He came, he DJed a few times, and then eventually I told him I also had a band. We were called Kaiser Chiefs at this point. Uh, I said, we've got a band. I played in the demo, and he loved it. Then the next thing I remember, this is how we knew something was happening, because... We did our second gig supporting Franz Ferdinand at the cockpit, in the middle room of the cockpit, right, little room. And he rang me up a few days later, and he said, and it, my phone rang, and I was like, oh, it's Tim Jones from NME. It's like, he was a major guy. And he, he said, so how was the gig? I was like, oh, it's amazing. Yeah, did this, this, and this. He goes, all right, that's probably enough. I was like, what do you mean? He goes, well, I'm going to review it. That's it. Oh, and he just interviewed you, doing a stealth interview. He just asked me. I'd reviewed our own gig. And then the next week it was in NME, my review of our own gig. And I was like, okay, fucking all right. 
It was only a little mention because it was a Franz Ferdinand review. I don't. There wasn't. I don't know who was. Maybe. The, maybe I don't know. I can't remember. Maybe it was a Kaiser Chiefs review, but it was my words. Wow. Oh. So I thought, hang on, something's <laughs> happening here because we tried for like seven years to get into the enemy. And you can't underestimate how significant that publication was in getting your name out there. Can you think of an equivalent now? Spotify. Oh. It really is. Spotify is like enemy was then. The influence that it has. Like if, if you work for the enemy in the noughties or even the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, record companies and people, agents and people in bands and artists and everything would always, if there was somebody in the room that would work for enemy, it'd be like, oh no, we need to speak to that guy from enemy. It's the same with Spotify now. If there's somebody in the room that works for Spotify, there's a queue of people like, hey, have you heard my demo? Wow. And, um, you know, getting onto playlists and like getting on a playlist would be like the equivalent of having single of the week in the enemy, which is, which is what we had with our demo. And that made all the difference. Amazing. And when, you know, they the sent to, I remember the first time I saw you on T4, I was like, oh my God, it's those guys from the cockpit yeah. on T4. Um, tell me some of your favorite times from the band. T4. <laughs> it's all about Vernon K. With Does you. anyone know what T4 is? Is it still on? Okay, and he's, he's shaking his head. I do know him. I do. Is T4 not on? No. What's the equivalent of T4? YouTube or some uh... <laughs> Spotify. So basically, anything good is now Spotify. <laughs> so were there pinch yourself moments where you met your heroes? <sighs> Who were you most starstruck to meet? Dave Grohl was always my hero. And um, we toured, I mean, there was, there was so much stuff. It was it was getting crazy. It was really getting crazy because we were just, um, like when we did Live 8, I can see Simon, he's in the back of the room there. He's waving now. There he is. He's a current Kaiser Chief. I haven't seen him for 10 years. <laughs> That's not true. Sorry. Oh, right. Yeah. Anyone heard of Live 8? <laughs> okay, Live 8. Yeah, you you were in Philadelphia? Yeah, we were in Philadelphia. That's why. So somebody asked me the other day, what's the biggest crowd that you've ever played to? And I said, uh, I think it's a million people. And, <laughs> and, I, and that's what we were told at the time. There's a million people actually in the audience. Oh, and actually, actually looked, there. I had to look oh, it imagine up. Imagine that in the, from the lens of COVID. <laughs> yeah. A million people in one place. Oh. No, so and we go were, on. What was that yeah, like? we just, I don't know, well, we, we were on Live 8, and I th we were on first in the mm. Philadelphia leg of Live 8, which is so odd. And I think after us was Will Smith, and it was like, and so this is, when was that, 2005, yeah? And so we'd been at the Joseph's Well. Anyone know Joseph's Well? Oh, God. <laughs> Woo! Woo! <laughs> yes. So we played, <laughs> like in January, it was mad. Honestly, 2005 was the maddest year of yeah. my life. Simon's life, and I assume lots of other people's lives. <laughs> probably mostly yours, to be fair. I was still in Leeds, but probably working at Morrison's. Um, no, so um, Simon used to work at Morrison's. Which one? Not not Marion Centre. Horsforth. <laughs> I was in Bakery, Marion Centre. <laughs> now then, enough Morrison's chat. Um, I don't think it is enough Morrison's chat. Isn't it? Have you seen the new one in Kirkstall? They could they sell hot pizzas there now. They got rid of a rotisserie chicken. There's okay. hot pizzas. There's burgers. Have they still got you get it on delivery? Market Street. Yeah, that's still there. But they got rid of the steamy veg they had for a while. Good. Now then, we digress. I think that's a good message. Replace veg. Replace veg with pizza. <sighs> yes. I think we could all learn <laughs> yeah. from that. Yeah. I'm on board with that. Um, have any people, famous people, who you met in uh, as a you know in your time at the Kaiser Chiefs have they gone on to become real friends in real life um <laughs> people you were a fan of you know I'd do you know what let me think um because I mean I mean do you know I'm mean, all I think about is Dave Grohl and how he's not my friend oh so close it upsets me time. it genuinely upsets me when I see him <laughs> when I was a kid I used to like I bought I made my own I love Dave Grohl t-shirt and 
but when we um, we toured with them, we did two tours. We toured in America and we toured in Australia. And um, it was honestly, a, it was just dream come true. He'd come into my our dressing room. I almost said my dressing room as though I had a separate dressing room, but I didn't. I didn't. <laughs> uh, I yeah, he came into our dressing room after every gig and would just like, hey, sit down like that. And he'd be talking and he'd be like mentioning Kurt. Kabe. I'd be like, do you mean, do you mean Kabe? Yeah. <laughs> Holy like, yeah. cow. Play it cool, play it cool. Yeah, yeah. He was dead good. So I, oh yeah, and then today I just, somebody, met, we were on a, me and Simon are on this WhatsApp group for Leeds United, and somebody who used to be my drum tech back in the 2005, whatever, he was reading the Dave Grohl doc, um, book, and he said, oh, they didn't, he didn't mention the time when we, he, so basically, we'd done this gig with them in Denver, and we it was like me, Simon, and Dan, I think. Not many others, weren't any others, was it? It's just me, Simon, and Dan, the drum tech. And we went to this bar with Dave Grohl, oh. and there was a band on. There was just a duo playing acoustic stuff, and they saw Dave, and then they did they did some songs, right, the, t the duo. And then, did, did Dave sing with them? I can't remember. Anyway, then we did I Predict a Riot somehow. Wow. Me and Simon and Dave Grohl came on stage and sang I'm Pretty Right with us. And at that point, I was like, okay. What? Let's have another Jaeger. Yeah. So that was your pinch yourself moment. That does sound like a dream yeah. you had. And then we came, really back to, we came back to the band bus <laughs> and uh, like, because there's five people in the band and only two of us decided to go out that night with Dave Grohl. <laughs> it was like, <laughs> maybe you should have done. <laughs> so did you lord it over the others with that? It wasn't that kind of atmosphere, really. If you walked in and started loading it up, it wouldn't have gone down well. Right. You had to sort of break it to them. <laughs> I'm sorry. It'd be like, I'm sorry, but we've just been on stage with Dave Grohl singing Happy to Riot. <laughs> and was this about the point where you got kicked out the band? Or? Yeah. <laughs> no. Only joking. We'll no, get I to had... that later. <laughs> so, um... didn't get kicked out. <laughs> no, I know. I'm sorry. Um... What was life on tour like? Did you have a, a life of excess? No, it was mainly horrible. Um, no, it wasn't. It was okay. I didn't love it. Um, it was just too busy for me. <laughs> What's it like? What do, you know? Give me an average. You know, you're in the middle of a tour. What's your day? The day. Well, it depends what kind of tour it is. If it's a American tour, you're on in a bus. No, actually, it depends if you're on a bus. Bus tours are great because I would. I used to treat each hour in bed as, um, like, you'd need two hours in a bunk for every normal hour in a bed. That's my, what was going right. in my head. So I would think nothing of having sort of 16 hours sleep <laughs> 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 because you could, because basically you couldn't sleep. So you were just always waking up. So I was, I'd get up really late, go to catering, get coffee, bacon sandwich, I mean, honestly, do you really want to hear this? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. We don't know. We haven't done this. You've it done depends. it loads, Also, if you're in it. the UK, we, we toured really well in the UK, but then sometimes when you're in Europe, it wasn't as nice. Mm -hmm. And in America, it was just shit. So, um, why? Why where? What? Why America? Yeah. Well, because we didn't play the... So the touring gets better the more people you play in front of. So we'd always look at Coldplay and we'd go, fucking hell, look, they're getting a... Look at them with the plane. They're just flying everywhere and we... So if you're in America and we're playing to like maybe 2,000 people a night, or even like less, like 1,000 or even 500, you, 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 don't, you don't get catering. That's the main thing. You don't get any catering. So you get out of your bus. If you're on a bus, you might be in a van. And then you've got to hunt for food. And then you've got to discover where the showers are. Uh, we used to get like a piece of paper on the when when we get up at festivals, there'd be a piece of paper on the on the tour bus like this mm. on the table table, and uh, paper. And it would just say <laughs> it would instruct us exactly mm. what to do. Wow! Step off the bus, walk, <laughs> turn left. Showers are here. So Food you, is here. You didn't have any. We were pathetic. Autonomy or. You couldn't be out, you know, popping out and seeing the local cultural highlights. Usually not, but sometimes I would. I would go and um, I got into a phase of like we were in Europe. I'd try and find, and this is true. It makes me sound pretty high end, but I would try and find an art museum. Lovely, because I found it very soothing. 
yeah. amongst all the craziness. And, and if they had a Van Gogh, I would stand and stare at it. <laughs> it's true, that. <laughs> Sounds romantic, but it's... Um, and made up. Did you see other bands go off the rails in touring? I can imagine that sort of life would become very difficult. Did you ever see sort of an uglier side of it, either in your own band or with others? Um, yeah, let's think. Let's think. Uglier side. I mean, let's think. It's gone silent now. I am thinking really deeply. In our band, it was okay. It was good. There was a certain amount of drinking, which would get um, to a boring level where it would become yeah. annoying. Um, what else? Other bands, I think we were quite good, really. Yeah. We were quite good. We'd always be there on time. We never missed a gig. We never were pissed when we went on stage, really. I never drank, actually, before a gig. I did that when we were in Parva, the band before, and we always did that. And I thought, oh, my God, this is so cool. Like, you just get really drunk, and then you go on stage. <laughs> and it turned out it was really a really bad idea mm. because things, the terrible things go wrong. Like, I remember Ricky once fell into my drum kit because he was, he was so drunk, and I was so drunk that it was like, I don't know, we just couldn't put the drums back together. And I actually, seriously, have dreams about this still. <laughs> and so after that, I never, we never drank. Well, so I didn't. It was very much like a, a job, a good Yorkshire work ethic, maybe. Would you say that? We were, prof we were dead professional. We, yeah. we never didn't give 100% on stage, especially Ricky, who gave mm. everything. Even if he was feeling terrible, he would always conjure it up from somewhere mm. uh, so we were always really good and you'd see other bands that were maybe cancelled and maybe that was like a bit out old-fashioned as well because oasis would do that wouldn't they they'd like cancel because they were pissed basically <laughs> or out of their minds on drugs and um well it is sort of part of it isn't it on paper you think of like that rock and roll lifestyle but in reality you know there's a lot of money wrapped up in touring and gigs i should yeah. imagine so do they do, they're not necessarily good bedfellows no, we didn't really, um, no, we we also, we were never at home, so we never thought that we, we couldn't really sort of, it wasn't like we'd go away for five days and we could fucking go mental and then we had three weeks at home just doing nothing. We were out for months and so we were like, if we don't, if we don't like, if we just get pissed every night, it's going to be a problem. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so we had alcohol free beer on our rider, which was, I think, was for me only like, <laughs> and so like maybe twice a week I would have alcohol free beer. Yeah. But actually, my favorite thing of the whole of gig days was because I didn't drink before the gig, I would have literally there'd be somebody at the side of the stage with a pint like that at the end of the gig, and I would have it, and it was oh, the so best. Leave pint. the drum kit, collect the beer, walk yeah, away. It's very exciting for me. That <sighs> I can imagine that. It's very nice. Uh, can I, I don't know if there's one down there later on when we finish this? That'd be yeah. really nice. Um, what was the songwriting process like within the band? You are responsible for some chuffing massive indie hits, which you've created with the band. Talk me through the songwriting process. Um, Who well, does what? It's interesting. Basically, it starts with millions of ideas and it gets filtered into not very many. And so I've just been, so I, I mentioned earlier, I think I've mentioned this to everyone I've spoken to today, but I've been, I'm doing a best man speech for a friend who used to be the singer in our band millions of years ago. And I cannot find the demo because if I find the demo, I can play it and everyone will laugh and think it's great. Okay. But I can't find it, but I have found everything else. So I've got millions and millions and millions of recordings. So I've heard today, just I've come back to Leeds and I've found, been in the loft, found tapes, and it's just literally us playing, arguing, talking, laughing. We do do that. We go in three times a week. We play. But I, I've also got millions of tapes of me and mini disc as well. Constantly recording all, like, pretty much when I'm not in rehearsal, I would just be recording, playing guitar. And I just play the guitar and piano all, all day, all the time, watching TV, playing the guitar trying really hard to come up with something that was good and then the the most the hardest bit of writing songs like that is when you go into the band 
and you play it and you just hope that they like it. So I found a tape of Simon earlier. This is from 25 years ago. So, well, 20 years ago. What, what day is it? <laughs> no, yeah, like 25 years ago, Simon. This I've heard this today for the first time and since of him just going, no, nah, I don't really like it. I don't think that's going to work. And and this is okay. This the riff. If you he said this the riff. If you can call it that is <laughs> is good. And but the rest of it I don't see going anywhere. And that was like so the process was just basically pushing. It was a push. It was a great push. And it was good for me because I would come up with like the I, the beginnings of the songs, take them to the rehearsal room, and then try and push them through. And if they didn't get through, which was like majority, and it was usually because they were shit. And the one the song that Simon was talking about on this tape that I heard was shit. Oh damn it! And I so, thought you were going to say was no. I predict a riot, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> I remember some resistance, some resistance to that at the time, but not from Simon. Mm. So but when Simon, when I played in the chorus of I Predict to Riot, no, not when I played it, but when we first played the song, I found something, I don't want that to break. When I first played, when we first played the song, and we'd like, I'd, I'd, I'd taken it in, we would, the, the I Predict to Riot chorus, and then we played it the first time, Simon clapped. Now, if you know what Simon's like, because I know this guy here, Adam down there, he knows what Simon's like, because Simon manages Waxworks. He's savage. And so it's hard to get. So when he claps, wow. I put it to out. I was like, here we go. Strap yourself in. This is it. Done it. Yeah. Amazing. And so you're recording all these rehearsals. Do you listen to them? Like Sometimes, you... yeah. I've got like a big bag of mini discs. I've got hours, maybe 200 hours. But did of... you listen to them at the time? Did I listen to them? Yeah, yeah, yeah. All the time. So I'd go into rehearsal, listen to everything back. So my advice back then to bands, they used to say, like, any advice. And we'd do something, I can't remember, an interview or something. And they'd say, what advice for bands? And i say, record everything. And I think it's different now because people have logic and they record it uh, as, though they're record, as though they're recording, producing a song. But you've got to get past all the shit to get the song that you are actually going to produce. So it takes, we, yeah. I mean, I think for the, I've got this, this bag and it's got 200 mini discs. And each one's got 70 odd minutes full. Anyone can do maths. <laughs> it's a lot of hours. Yeah. And there's about 10 songs in there. Right. Because, I mean, from my point of view, when I, when I do my reports for telly, making them is easy, but going and watching them back can sometimes be a bit intimidating. You think, oh, God, what if I've messed it up? Or, you yeah. know, is there an element of that? It's difficult to listen back in case it's not good. No, not, not band rehearsals, but I mean, I wouldn't listen to a gig back. Mm. I would never, and I wouldn't really listen to like an album. I didn't listen to our first album for 12 years. Really? And then I listened to it and I liked it, but it took that long to yeah. actually. <laughs> wow. We recorded it and then I know it's done. Once it's done, you can't change it. And mm. Now then, um, I'm sure you've been asked about this a lot, but at what point did you realize you didn't want to be in this band that you'd spent years? building at what point oh it was quite a... i always remember saying i only wanted to do one album and then we even talked about changing our name which was kind of stupid but um so i only wanted to do one album really i didn't really i used to say that i didn't really i always thought we'd do more um but the third um yeah i love the first three the fourth one by the time the fourth one came along my dad was really ill and it was really bad and i didn't like I just sort of had a different perception of what being in a band meant to what the rest of life meant. And so I was sort of, I was, I wasn't really, after the third album, I didn't really kind of think about writing another album. And then Ricky came in to my studio with Ollie and told me this idea he'd had for the album, Choose Your Own, our fourth album was this weird internet-based choose-your-own um, playlist, pay what you like, kind of weird, let's mess with the music industry, kind of whatever it was, website. And it was really odd, but it really gave me this amazing impetus to do something. I had this idea, okay, we're not just going to write an album, record the album, go on the tour, the same tour that we've done the last two albums, which is 
UK, Europe, Australia, Japan, America, the same places, same venues, same faces, even when you get there. I wanted to do something different. So this was amazing. I thought, yeah, get into this. Um, so around before that, I was thinking, mm, the band, I'm not really, in, I don't think we'll do another album. And then we did that fourth album. Then my dad died and we, I just didn't want to do it at all. Yeah, it was time. So how hard was it at that point to leave? How hard? Mm. I told everyone in 2011, I wanted to break, I wanted to split the whole thing up. But, um, so I basically had a year of touring because we had it all booked. So when 2011 to, to the whole 12 months of touring, knowing that at the end of it, I wasn't going to be in it. Mm. It was rubbish. Yeah. And did they all know as well? Yeah. Yeah, it was it was a, not a good year, but after that, I just I was counting the days, and after when it when it finished, and I got home after it, I was like, cut my hair. Did, you know, like there's a thing that I cut my I, the first thing I did was cut my hair because like, also it's really like really stressful. Like, yeah, yeah. And my friend said, "Oh, it's your divorce cut." Yeah, and um, we've all been there, but not with an in yeah, well, platinum band, but you know. <laughs> but after I think so. Yeah, I'd been in the band doing the same with the same, mainly the same people doing, trying so hard to get songs, you know, from 97 to 2012, which is 15 years. And it takes a real massive toll on you because you can't think of it. It took me six months. My stomach was in bits, like totally like anxious stomach. And it took me about maybe three months for it to just oh, relax. My shoulders went down. Because I'd wake up in the morning, there'd be like 60 emails. Yeah. And then there'd be another 60 once you've replied. And it was just too hectic and I didn't like it. And I wanted to do something else. It was nearly 10 years ago. It was 2012. Um, it sounds like it was the right decision. But do you have any regrets about leaving? I don't have any regrets. But I do. And since lockdown, I do miss. Well, what I miss is the project. Like, I love, because that was my life. It was the project. So I'd write a song, it was for the Kaiser Chiefs. Mm. And now I've spent the last few years writing for other people. And you don't get that same feeling of it's a project. You don't feel like you are going to, it doesn't mean as much. So you could work with someone, you write one song, and then you never see them again. But the song might come out, but it doesn't mean anything. Mm. And so at first, that was exactly what I wanted. I loved it. And then when the lockdown happened, I was just suddenly like, oh, I wish I was could write for the band again. I wish I could do that. And, uh, or at least something that was a whole, yeah. as opposed to like, just this day, do that, this day, do that. Like a job, I suppose. You did a job on the other ones. And yeah. There was your life. Yeah. Well, now that we've got to the point where you've left the band, let's have a look at modern times, modern Nick. Um, you've blossomed. You've worked with huge names, including Dua Lipa, Mark Ronson, 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 <laughs> Shirley Bassey, Bassey, Bassey. I mean, blimey. How did that happen? What's Dua Lipa like? Um, that was right before she got, in fact, hang on. Um, Dua Lipa, yeah, so she came into, yeah, so when I've, let me think, she was unsigned. And I had this manager, and they said, "Come work with Dua Lipa. And I thought, "Okay, cool." Oh, I had a friend actually who'd been who'd written a song. Do you know "Hotter Than Hell"? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He'd written that, and he wanted to do some more. So I, she came to my studio, and I've seen the photographs today because again, I'm digging for photographs for this best man speech. It's the perfect day for it. Um, so I'd seen this picture. Of her. She's got this jacket on, leather jacket that says "Dew a fucking leaper" on the back, and she's Ooh. like six foot tall. Crikey. And we, she my mum wouldn't like it if I had Kathy fucking Boo on my on my top. <laughs> you should do I that. I would be allowed to wear it at work. Good you lord. <laughs> she was totally what different. Punk. She's, That's she amazing. Was a total party girl, really, and just um, she was amazing though. She was the best person I'd worked with. Very very talented lady, isn't she? Yeah. We went to the sandwich shop, and everyone would stare. Not that they knew her, but she was just like. Wow. 
And your solo album, Tell Your Friends, um, has a very nostalgic sound and aesthetic. Tell me about that. Why so nostalgic? Oh, it wasn't on purpose. I actually think the reason was because I did it in my studio and all the instruments that I've got are really old. And so I just collected like lots of different instruments over the years. And so the drums are from the 70s and the, the guitars are from the 60s and the bass and stuff. And um, I guess I just went there. I didn't go, okay, I'm going to do this. Mm. But I think I followed my instincts. So I think when I first got into writing music, it was definitely Beatles-inspired. And again, I listened to a demo today because I found, I'm looking for this best man's Do you remember? <laughs> and I found a really early run-through of a set from Runston Parva. Oh. That was the band before Parva, but it was Ricky and me and Whitey, the guitarist. And the songs are so Beatlesy. And Ricky was singing like this. <laughs> and it was all like psychedelic. And so I think um, that's my natural place yeah. to be. And I think we went away from that. So we went Runston Parva, we were all like 60s and psychedelic and weird. And then we went away because we tried to do this garage rock thing. And, and then when we came back to, to the, one of the first songs we wrote with Kaiser Chiefs was Oh My God, which I think is really psychedelic and 60s yeah. and weird. So I think that's like my happy place. Yeah. 60s circuit psychedelic. Um, you co-wrote Feels Like Summer for the Sean the Sheep Again, movie. 60s. Yeah. I mean, that is an absolute bop, isn't it? I love that song. It Does Sean keep in touch? Sean the Sheep, no. <laughs> what a dickhead. But, um, <laughs> I, I, do you know what? It's so weird. It's because I'm not, I'm not making this up. I saw a photograph today because I wrote it with the guy from Ash. Yeah. And I saw a photograph of him to, today in the studio playing the guitar for it. I'm going to stop going on about this best man speech. Oh, Maybe I'll, anyway. <laughs> um, oh, uh, so you're a dad now. Yeah. Um, is your child interested in your career and your work? No, I keep showing her, like, I go on YouTube and I say, look, this daddy. And then she goes, is this daddy? As she points to Ricky. <laughs> I say, no. <laughs> I'm the guy at the back. <laughs> With the cool hair. <laughs> She's like, and then Whitey will come on, there'll be a screen of Whitey, and she'll go, is that daddy? <laughs> yeah. Oh, dear. And yeah, I keep, I keep wanting to, yeah, I'm really, I think I'm a, I'm a real needy, and like, like what my, when I was a kid, I was like a real show kind of, you know, I could have been in like, you know, that kind of jazz hands kid. So I'm even needy to my own three-year-old child going, look, what do you think of this? <laughs> do you like me? <laughs> She's like, uh, no. <laughs> Is that daddy? <laughs> now then, let's get to a little bit about the music industry. Um, that's uh, something I believe everybody's interested in. Um, so many bands and artists get attention from labels, thinking back to our time back in the yeah. day, you know, there was a lot of it around, but it, it comes to very little for so many of them. Um, at what point did you realize that it was happening for the Kaiser Chiefs? And why do you think that was? Well, one thing I think is, I mean, I don't know whether it's, one thing I always think is a really good thing is to, in terms of advances, we had a really low advance, we had one offer, and we had a low advance and a lot of bands around got really, really high advances and they didn't make an album or they did make an album, but it didn't come out or maybe they get dropped on the day it comes out. I've heard of this. Did that happen? Yeah, because it's, a, it's like um, their obligation, the record company's obligation is fulfilled. The album is out. But also, guess what? I've seen that happen. Yeah. That's brutal, isn't it? Yeah. Who? who? Island. <laughs> I'm joking. <laughs> I think, I don't, I don't know actually, um, but that does happen. Uh, no, I know, I won't say who, but I do know someone, that, it was a second album uh, that happened. Mm. But um, yeah, take as little as you can. I mean, we didn't have a choice. It wasn't like, hey, can you offer us less? <laughs> <laughs> it was, can you offer us more? But they didn't. Um, and, I'm sorry. Oh, sorry, no, I was just going to say, um, 
talk me through your experiences with the music industry because if you're not in it you yeah. don't know you, I mean I imagine like music executives and like vices and and, yeah, and things well, like that what's it like they're strange characters really um I'll give you an example I'll give you an example of what what they're like I won't name any names but the other day I was somewhere and I bumped into this person who is a major industry person and I said and I was with my daughter this is what he did. He went like, get my phone out for this. He was talking to my three-year-old daughter, and he was like, so, how old are you? Right, okay. He's just emailing to me. How old are you? And I was like, it's a perfect example of, of um, nobody really got that, did they? I, I got I the impression Simon's he's, laughing. He's not, a, he's not a people person, is he? Well, what it is, is I mean, I've, made, I've done unconscious it, bias there. It's, it's an interesting... Are they? I didn't know it was a man. Or did you say it was a man? I don't know. Maybe I said a guy. Apologies if there was unconscious bias. But my, my point is that um, they're a funny bunch, the industry. But you need them, unfortunately. Um, is that still the case? Because things have changed, you know, um, since the Kaiser Chiefs yeah. started. This is a completely different industry now. To what extent do you need those executives? I don't know. I'd like to know from people, from younger people, really. Um, I do think it does help. Okay, an example of why it helps is that if you get assigned to a major, say Columbia, and you've got, and your album's coming out, Radio 1 are more likely to at least listen to it and um, more likely to playlist it. Or six, uh, Not Six Music, but Radio 1, yeah. Um, because of just, I think it comes with a certain badge of, oh, okay, this must be good. Um, but then in the alternative world, I don't think it really matters that much because if you, any, if you've got a good song and you've got a good vibe and a good feel, it can get onto six music. They don't seem to have that same, I mean, they're not interested in what label the band is on, I don't think. In fact, it probably works against them if they're on a major label. Um, I mean, as an employee of the BBC myself, I'm delighted to hear you referencing the BBC radio stations. Yeah. But, I mean, are are they still as important, or can can it be done? Radio. Uh, yeah, ra the main radio stations, or can it be done? You know, through social media, online. Yeah. What do you think? Well, I mean, I'm always surprised when I see somebody on Spotify who's got like uh, like half a billion streams, and it's someone who I may have heard the name of, but I haven't heard the songs. And I just think there's a whole world of, there's a whole ecosystem of sort of things I'm just not on board with. Yeah. Um, it might be the stuff that, you know, we we were listening to it in, in nightclubs in the noughties. Maybe it's just all online now. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, because I didn't go to Radio 1 and think, okay, I'm going to find my new favorite band. <laughs> okay. Steps. <laughs> but But I would like to know what people's experiences are now of like, how important they think radio is and how important they think major labels are. Mm. I do think labels are good because they do take, I mean, I've just produced this band called Priestgate who are from Driffield. Oh, nice. And a scientist label, um, Lucky Number, who are an indie label. But what they've done is so good. It's just an amazing job they've done. So passionate, so into it. They've put a lot of money and time into it to try and push it, push it, push it to radio and press and just playlist as well, really important. Mm -hmm. And they're doing really well. And I think if the band released it themselves, they get overwhelmed. I've released, I released my own record on my own label and I was the only person involved. I was the only one and I hated it because right. it was, I was totally overwhelmed with, there's a whole load of admin stuff such as like um, ISRC numbers and all the stuff you got no interest in, but you need to do, or else nothing will happen. And then you've got all the promotion. And so if you've got an actual team of people who know how to do it, they've been doing it for 10, 20 years, they've got they've got power, they've got some muscle. And depend, you know, major, major, major labels have got more muscle than tiny labels. But ultimately, it's down to songs. Yeah. It always has been and it always will be, I think. You had your own label for a time, didn't you? Birthday Records. Yeah. Uh, what was that like being on the other Expensive. side? Expensive. <laughs> and again, no fun. 
for me personally, I like to make music. And when it comes to mark, I'm the worst marketing person. Uh, I'm not very good at it. Mm. I don't, I'm not very good at it. So, how does uh, streaming revenue work? Do you still get a good income from the Kaiser Chiefs tracks? And what about <coughs> other songs that you've sort of had a co writing credit yeah. for? How, how does that all work? Well, publishing is the worst uh, way of making money out of streaming, unfortunately. And most of my stuff is through publishing. I suppose, no, I mean, the Kaiser Chiefs stuff is um is performance as well so it's record label based so yeah i still get some for that but for, uh songs that you co-write it's a really weird world i don't know how people c can start out it's a real hard word it's hard to do that if you're just the writer because you split it with however many people have written it then the publisher gets less the publishing company gets less than the uh record company and so the publisher then has to split it between, blah, 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 blah. and so there's not much left for writers, which is why I think the the mo more recent sort of government, um, you know, the the oh, what's it called? Yes, broken record, all that, yeah. And the government, um, oh, they're trying to change it. Basically, they did a yeah. whole the streaming inquiry. Thank you. The streaming inquiry is great. I'm all about that because. I think what happened was right at the beginning when no one realized how big Spotify was going to be, the record companies did a great deal and the publishers did a really bad deal. And so somehow we need to balance it so that it's a bit more equal. Record companies love it. Mm. It's amazing because like all the records that they put out 45 years ago, they don't have to reissue them or anything. It's just yeah. coming in every day, the money. And Lovely stuff. Is, you know, touring and merch a more of a revenue stream than than re record plays is these days is that um yeah i think so um touring is is the best i think yeah, yeah. Wow. makes um which is why yeah i don't know touring kind of lifted off massively i think after yeah. so sort of like i think touring's well let's forget covid but touring's the biggest it's ever been ever mm. I always feel a bit disappointed when you have to go to a gig and it's massive. Yeah. I like little gigs. But anyway. Um, I like going to little gigs. Yeah. They're lovely, aren't they? Yeah. Live at Leeds at the weekend. That'll be loads of little gigs. Now then, um, what advice do you have for people trying to make it in the music industry? Who Forget may about be it. in this room. <laughs> Don't bother. Um, what advice? To make in what what way in creative or in the oh I don't know in the how the hell do you get your foot in the door in any uh, industry um, I mean if you say as a producer and as say a producer. as a as a an yeah. artist yourself well people ask me sometimes they go you know I want to write I want to be a writer and they send me stuff and I want to be a writer and I think the best thing if you like it's exactly what the only reason I'm a writer is because I started a band and we played and we got famous and I'm a writer. Um, but if you take out the band stuff, I can't just say I'm a writer and, and just start from nowhere. So I think it's about not starting from nowhere and going, okay, I'm going to be just a writer. I think you've got to prove yourself and you've got to go, if you can't sing, then you get you find someone that can sing. And if you just want to write and you don't want to be in the band, just and if you want to produce, find people who are, you go and be, I mean, do, do you know what? I think BBC Introducing is the greatest thing. It's Bob on, isn't it? It's amazing. It's really good. I found so much stuff on that that I love and people I want to work with and people I do work with all because of yeah. introducing. So I think if you were starting out, you hear someone introducing, you listen to it religiously every Saturday or on iPlayer and you find someone you like the sound of, you get in touch Sorry, with Sorry, Nick, the confetti cannon's gone off early. Oh, fine. Can we save this for the end, please? <laughs> that, that was it. <laughs> um, I think we're almost uh, at time, but it, does anybody in the room have any questions? Raise your hand if you do. Just make one up. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Do you want to know how to do it? Yes. Let's try and remember. I've got a an email address that's new music at prediction music dot com. 
That's so I've got a publishing company called that Prediction Music. That sounded like Music. you made that up, but that's true, isn't it? That's I have to, sometimes, <laughs> I have to, sometimes I have to delve into my mind to shuffle all the other stuff away and go and find actual information. So I have got a, produ- a, a publishing company called Prediction Music. So that's that. Oh, you're welcome. Anybody else? Any questions? Oh, this lady here. So what would be like your best advice for a new band starting out getting gigs outside of their local scene, like um, in different cities and stuff? Right. Um, I'm just trying to think what our experience was. So I think it's important to just do as many gigs as you you can. Um, Yeah, because you don't want to wear out your city. I remember thinking that. You only want to do like one a month, really, in your own place. Because you've got like 150 friends. Well, you haven't got 150 friends. But you might have 150 people that might come and see. Well, actually, that's too many. What am I talking about? You've probably got about 25 people that might come and see you. (laughs) And then you've got... Maybe they've got a friend. You know, you don't want to exhaust them. Okay, so then try to get out of the city to do other gigs. I think what we did was we, we didn't want to go Manchester or Sheffield or anything like that. We just thought London. I don't know why. We spent so much time on the M1. It never helped us. <laughs> but we used to just, it was a good experience though. So I would just say, don't worry about how good the gig is, how many people are going to be, how far away it is. Just get there, try it. Because there's, there's so many ways in with like, I'd be, I, if I was a band now, I'd probably just be on Instagram for following bands, follow, see who they follow. Um, you know, like they might invite you to do a gig because they like your stuff. Chat to people on, you know, just Instagram and find promoters. They might follow a promoter that they've just done a gig with and you follow them and then you chat with them, blah, 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 blah. And then suddenly they're inviting you to do a gig in Sheffield. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's my only advice. Anybody Just, else? Any other questions? Uh, were oh. you always like um, producing when you were in the band, or have you sort of just got into that um, afterwards? Yeah, our first demos were done by me and Peanut, who's the keyboard player in the band, and we were just finding our way. Really, we I think we used Logic. I think we started with Cubase actually, and and we'd record the stuff. We borrowed mics. It was just like. We didn't know how to do it, but you just did it until it sounded any good. And then, um, yeah, we made the demos, the first three songs. Uh, so we were always producing then. And then just like producing on the sidelines, but not really producing the band. Like, you know, just like in your, at home, just creating, doing whatever. And then then gradually, I think I did a few songs for the band in on the fourth album. Thank you. Anybody else? Simon oh, Ricks. Simon Ricks. Well, he said, do you know any excellent podcasts about people's journeys in the industry? Well, I have. Yeah, I did In lockdown, I did do a podcast called Do You Know How Many Bands There Are? And there's 10 amazing episodes available now. And um, Like and subscribe. Like and subscribe. Like and subscribe. Smash that, <laughs> smash that like button. <laughs> <laughs> and um, yeah, there should be a thing yeah, underneath I here. Um, there was another question somewhere. Yes. Uh, yeah, as an artist, like, um, what's your sort of like breakdown in terms of, like your revenue? Does it come more from like streaming or like touring or like like which which sort of areas does that best sort of focus on? Uh, currently, um. It's a good question because I don't really know. Um, I think back in the, um, yeah, it's different from what it was when we were just starting the band and, and, you know, the first album and stuff, it was about sales and it was about touring. Um, Now, I actually think Simon Riggs would probably be able to answer this question better because he probably knows more about touring. Touring, there you go. But as a, a writer now, for me personally who doesn't tour, um, it's actually old songs that do the most biz, sorry to say. Although I did have a song last year that streamed really well, but I haven't actually, I don't know how much has come in from that yet. Probably about, well, I could probably count it on my hands. 
Sorry, just another quick question. Um, so say if you're putting it onto like um, streaming platforms, how, what would be the best way to sort of like push the music out there? Like how would how would you go uh, go about like pushing a song? Like what would you do to make it so people actually listen to it? Oh, it's hard, isn't it? Because I think people get tired of your, like say if you just keep hammering, hey, it's many a single on your socials. I actually know, I, there's, a, there's a brilliant um, YouTube channel called Burstimo. Do you know that? Check out Burstimo because they answer all these questions a lot better than I do. They, um, I think they come out like once a week. They seem to know everything about streaming, everything about publishing, and everything that you need to know these days about how to promote, how to release, and all this sort of thing. And so I think their biggest at the moment, the thing that they're talking about promoting is TikTok. And apparently there's the, it's the only platform that you can keep banging on about yourself and no one, no one cares. <laughs> so you can talk about your single release 10 times a day and, and it's fine, apparently. I don't know, because I don't do it. But I think if you're on Twitter and you're on Instagram doing the same thing, hey, listen to my single, people are just going to start unfollowing you. That's my advice. Thank you. Anybody else? Oh. Yeah. Last question, this one. So get your hands ready for a little bit of applause. Here we go. What's your question? Getting ready. So um, I've been, personally, I've been in a few bands myself that have kind of fallen through. And I've, not, I've got a few friends who've been in bands who've also not lasted very long. So my question would be, uh, for any new starting out bands, what would be your advice on how not to kind of, like, how would you stay together kind of thing? It's a good oh, question. That's a good question. How to stay together? I think. For a band. For a band, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I think you'll have to like each other to a certain degree. Um, I've, although I have been in band, like, since the band, I've, I've done like. Solo band, solo band, and it was pretty much strangers, and that was nice as well. <laughs> but like with my band, with the Kites Chiefs, three of us were in the same class when we were eleven, so we knew each other pretty well. Me and Simon knew each other really well because we were like best friends at school. Uh, so I think that goes a long way. But I think I really don't know why some bands keep going and some bands just break up. Um, I'll talk about the best man speech again, actually. Um, <laughs> the guy that I'm going to be the best man for, uh, he was the singer in our band, and that did not last at all because we just did not click. Um, so we never did a gig. We did a demo. I'm searching for. We never did a gig, and it didn't work because we just didn't click musically in the band, whatever it was. It just didn't work. And there's various people that have been in the band that I've been in that, that you just know aren't going to last. And I think it's just about personality, really and desire some people left the band various states of our band i think you always have to have one person who's insane about how much they believe in it and if you get two people who are insane about how much they believe in it, that's even better and three is unbelievable it's probably the limit <laughs> the other two are just like that they're just filler the other two are some <laughs> i think the other two are like well if they think it's gonna work then i can't leave yeah Maybe you've not just found the right band yet. Oh, yeah, maybe it's just finding the right people. But you'll that's know when you'll know. That's all we've got time for. That's been right good. I've enjoyed that. Right. Ladies and gentlemen, Nick Hudson. <laughs> Kathy Boo. <Hey>. Like <laughs> and subscribe. <laughs> uh, thanks to everyone for coming today. Thanks to just give me a second. Uh, thanks for everyone for coming uh, and enjoying the day. Um, in a minute, we're going to have networking drinks uh, in the bar downstairs. If you see some of our team, they've given away drinks, tokens that so you can redeem for a free drink at the bar downstairs uh, from now on. Uh, just like it was amazing to hear some of the questions from people throughout today. And I just would remind you that through the Launchpad website, there's quite a lot of resources there. There's like bookable slots that you can do uh, every two weeks with the team to ask a lot of those questions. Some questions there about building like buzz around releases and stuff. Um, we're actually starting a whole series of events like this, not uh, not all as big as this. We've got an event in Hull next week, and in two weeks' time we're in Bradford with a panel called Building a Buzz and a panel called Getting Release Ready. So those of you looking to release your music, there's something happening in Bradford uh, two weeks tomorrow that pretty much uh, hits that exactly. So that's all shared on the, the, on the Launchpad channels as well. Uh, 
Thanks a lot. Thanks to all our speakers. Thanks to our, spons our sponsors, BPI and our funders, Youth Music, Arts Council England, uh, the Talent Development Partnership through PRS Foundation, sponsored by PPL, Arts at Leeds, Leeds City Council, Leeds 2023. I'll probably missed someone. Kicker, Yorkshire Music Forum. Uh, have a good night, everyone. Oh, yeah, and don't forget, we've got uh, the Yorkshire Music Forum showcase tonight with three bands, with Fopar, with Pleasure Centre, with Fuzz Lightyear. Um, you are all eligible for free entry to that to show your wristbands. Uh, that's going to be kicking off about half past seven. Uh, thanks. Uh, see you next time. Yeah.